This channel is part of the History Hit Network. It's July. Ruth, Peter and Tom are more than halfway through their time on the farm. The pea crop has flowered and very soon it should be producing a harvest. I yeah. am flabbergasted with just how many peas are on each plant. It's staggering, isn't it? The barley cereal crop is also thriving. As are the sheep and the pigs. Are you all right? Yeah. <laughs> but farming was not the only way monastic land was exploited to make money. The monasteries encouraged other enterprises and would send representatives to meet with tenants who wanted to expand into new areas. Professor James Clark, an expert in medieval history, has come to meet Tom and Peter to explain the abundant opportunities on the land. Of course, it's important to remember that the monastery's economic interests are not just confined to farming. The monastery owns a huge diversity of, of landscape, and it's especially interested in the natural resources uh, that that landscape contains. Um, and perhaps the preeminent interest in this period in, in that regard is, is lead, lead mining. Would farms like us be involved in these commercial processes then? We know that just prior to the dissolution, a number of tenants are beginning to branch off into, into those areas. They can't rely for a secure income on the produce of, of, of farming alone. The church imposed itself on the landscape of medieval England. Great abbeys and cathedrals were built to stamp the church's authority across the country. Vital to their construction was lead. Its malleability and resistance to corrosion made it perfect for roofing, guttering and windows. This created huge demand for the material. Following in the footsteps of Tudor farmers, the boys are heading off to mine their own lead. Areas around the Pennines, Derbyshire and Shropshire were the biggest centres of lead mining in the Tudor period. The mines are now long abandoned and overgrown. Tom and Peter are meeting with experts Colin Richards and Nick Southwick to reopen one. Right, Peter, here's your lead mine. Oh, brilliant, Colin. <laughs> it looks a bit more like a, uh, a rabbit warren or something. Yes, we've got to do a, a little bit of digging to actually get into the mine, but uh, the mines in this area haven't been operated for 130 years. Would farmers be doing this sort of thing? Oh, yes, because in any age, if you could sort of gain extra money, you could improve your life. You could get a better horse, better clothes, better wine. So it could make all the difference between a subsistence existence and one where you could have a few luxuries. I suppose it was a metal very much in demand, especially with um, the monasteries and what they were using it for. You could sell all you could extract. So, you know, you could turn your labour into money very easily. Farmers who turned their hand to mining in the summer months could earn up to four pounds in extra income, the equivalent of buying 80 extra sheep for the farm. I think it's getting big. Shovel this out, Pete. Yeah. Then I think we can get a body in. Shall I do that? I'm a bit svelter than you are, Peter. You are, you are a little homunculus, Tom. We'll <laughs> get you down there. Here he goes. Push. <laughs> He's going. Oh, that opens up quite quite a lot, actually. Yeah, it should do. Is there room for another one? I reckon. Just follow on. Oh, dear. It widens out a bit, so yeah. we could probably fit that wheelbarrow in, if you like. No. Thank you. All right, here we go. You lads OK? As one of the kingdom's largest landowners, Monasteries owned vast waterways that were full of another valuable resource, fish. The church encouraged people to fast from meat three days a week, creating a high demand for fish. Ruth setting out to catch one of the most popular fish of the day, eels. The first job is to make an eel trap, with help from basket maker Simon Cooper. Whoops, I nearly lost that. <laughs> Lovely and soaked and bendy. Well soaked, soaked and earth. <laughs> yeah, nice and bendy. 
Look at that. They're using willow, a tree commonly found beside streams. So we're using the twinning technique, which means we're using two at once, yeah? That's it. Woven one over the other. Around we the... twist them each time. They go around. Go around the stave, yes. Just get it tight, otherwise we'll lose anything we might be catching. History hit is like Netflix, just for history fans. With exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. With familiar faces such as Dan Jones and Dr. Eleanor Yanega, we've got hundreds of documentaries covering the greatest figures and events of medieval history. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Chronicle fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code CHRONICLE at checkout. The traps are made from two woven cones, one slotted inside the other. Yes. Oh, yeah, you can see it in yeah, that this, one, this is, this is a very open design one, and you can see the eel, eel will go in through the front here. Right, so the eel swims in, gets through that gap nice and easily, but because it's all spiky, you can't turn around and go you back through it. You can't turn around and go out, no. This method of laying traps for fish is a technique that goes back thousands of years and is even mentioned in the Magna Carta. And, of course, one thing with the, the eel as well is very easy to keep alive out of water, yeah. as long as it's damp. Yeah, uh, so you cool. can transport them in damp sacking. S sacking or straw, yes, yes. You didn't really need refrigeration because um, they, they, they almost breathe, can almost breathe through their, their skin. This then is going to be dropped into here. Yeah. And then we need to try and weave the whole weave, lot together. Weave the, the whole lot together. Yeah, so mm. what you mean about nice. needing to be really firm. Yes, with it. we hope our basket work isn't too open so the eel will find a way out because they're very, very good at finding little holes. <laughs> <laughs> With the mine reopened, the team are navigating the passages that should take them to the lead ore. Monasteries granted leases to those who wanted to mine for lead on their land. Uh, come to a mine, you said, Tom. <laughs> It'll be fun. So, Colin, how far are we going in at the moment? Well, we need to go in about sort of 300, 400 yards. Whoa! That is fantastic. This is a lot bigger than I thought it would be. So, when it was in sort of full production, there would have been men on platforms all over this space. This is the first time the mine has been worked for over a century. So, what are we, what are we actually looking for, Colin? You're looking for those silver specks in the rock, which are the sort of galena, the lead, to see where you've got a concentration, where you've got the richest ore deposits, and then work from there. Miners worked in pairs and removed the lead ore by hand using hammers and chisels. The skill is hitting the chisel without hitting the holder. Oh. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. Ooh! <laughs> 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 the veins of lead ore were often set at 45 degree angles in the rock, making for tough working conditions. I feel like we're going quite far in. Is this yeah, I true? think you've broken off a, a decent piece there. The weight of the rock was the key indication of lead ore being present. What are we thinking, Tom? How does it feel weight-wise? No. Have a feel. It's like a feather. I don't think we'd have made very good mine. <laughs> We're just getting our eye in. Oh, look at that. That's actually a lot heavier. Feel that. You can feel the extra weight, can't you, compared to the other bit? What's yeah. that look like? Oh, yes, that's, that's what we're looking for. Are we finished, then? Is that, is that enough? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you... Looking at about 50 barrel loads a day. <laughs> We've got one lump in the bottom <laughs> at the moment. Better pick up the pace. Let's give that a go. Oh, no, that's what I'm talking about, Tom. <laughs> Look at that. That is a piece of lead ore. Whole families often worked in the mines. 
Every day they face dangers from flooding and long-term inhalation of poisonous lead dust. Every little bit counted. So, you know, the, the small children would be down here sort of as bits were flying off, putting them in the barrows and uh, taking them to the surface. There was, um, you know, nothing wasted. Lift with your legs. Straight back. <laughs> was that the creak in the barrow or you? <laughs> it's amazing how much they must have had to have shifted, Colin. This is hard, hard work. That's why I'm doing it, not Tom. To exploit their natural resources above ground, monasteries leased out the fishing rights on rivers. Their traps complete, the next job is for Ruth and Simon to set them in the water. It, it's, it's, it's best to set these, these traps in the e evening because the eels, through the heat of the day, they tend just to, to lurk it in the shadows and in, in, in the cool because they don't like getting too, too hot, really. So, right. so that just drops in on that the should, side. That should drop in, and we need to just tie, tie, a, tie a mark to a reed somewhere. Eels are drawn to dark places, so the traps must be left in the shade. I wondered if we perhaps headed off over there to under that shady tree. It looks sort of, you know, a good place which yours might lurk. So we weight this pot so it sits on the bottom, yeah? Yes, so that the yields work can, can swim straight into it. That's it, parallel to the bank, that's lovely. The ends of the traps are filled with dead fish, an eel's favourite food. Nice, stinky fish. Stinkier the better, so they can smell it. Oh, good old that, that'll attract them. Wet hay. I'll just plug at the top so that the fish can't get out. It's not just to keep the bait in, but it's to stop the eels getting out. I always want to call them pots, but that's not the right name for them, is it? Down here, we tend to tend to call them puchins, but I know all, all around the country there's there's grigs, wheels. It's almost an indicator, really, of a truly ancient craft, isn't it, when the tools have all these regional names? Of course, they all had different shapes as well depending on the maker, really. <laughs> Down oh, you go. Going to sink. Is this branch going to hold it? I think so. The lead ore has been brought to the surface of the mine. Now it must be smelted to extract the metal from the rock. This is done by heating the ore to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. To achieve these temperatures, the Tudor smelter would make use of their natural environment. Furnaces were placed on windy hilltops to help fan the flames. A superfuel known as white coal was used. It was made by simply drying out wood in a kiln. So it's like any kind of oven, really, like you know, a bread oven or anything. Very much. It's very similar to a bread oven in that you heat the stone up, and then it's the heat in the mass of the oven which dries the wood. Heating the wood removes moisture and impurities, allowing it to burn hotter. That's the one we've been looking for. The kiln must be airtight, so gaps are filled with clay. So I'll put a little fire in here. And then, if it's completely sealed, the only smoke will be coming out the entrance. Right, if I was you, Tom, I'd get a handful of clay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I need to, but sure. <laughs> I'll indulge you, Tom. OK. <laughs> I think we get a few gaps here, Tom. But I can still rescue this quickly. It's very atmospheric. I might owe you an ale. The best wood to convert into white coal is oak. Oh, that was almost my fingers. <laughs> Got plenty of wood there, I see. Here we go. Is this going to change much, Colin? No, it won't change appearance much, but any residual moisture will be driven off through the heat in these stones. To help the lead melt more quickly, the ore is smashed into small pieces. Give it a whack. Put your arms into it while you have to smelt it. There See? Go. There you go. Brilliant. 
So how much of this is going to be lead? 80%. That high? That's uh, That brilliant. high. So yeah. it's a good return on yeah. our effort. Absolutely. Very good. Very good. The wood, having dried for four hours in the kiln, is now white coal. Is it, is it hot? I'm not going to lie to you, it looks pretty similar. <laughs> well, it's incredibly dry. The next job is to build a furnace to smelt the lead ore. At the base, Colin is making a hearth where the lead will collect. So we just need to spread it so that it goes up the slope a little bit more. So this clay lining is going to firm up during the firing process and it will actually be our bowl of lead at the end of the smelting. On top of the hearth, a fire is built by stacking layers of timber. And we'll lay these as close together as we can. Right. The furnace is finished with layers of hot burning white coal, onto which the lead ore is placed. It's all our broken. Freshly crushed ore, yeah. OK. That's pretty heavy. Excellent. Well done, lads. Gosh, there's some weight in that. <laughs> Should we just leave it in the sack? Yeah. Look at that glinting in the sunlight. We fold this over and we put the white coal over the top. And that heat wrapped round our ore is going to be the final sort of almost turbo boost to smelt it and melt it and be the conclusion of this big inferno. <laughs> Eels were a staple food in monasteries that owned rivers. But for lay people who needed permission to access these rivers, they were a luxury. Simon and Ruth are heading out to check the traps. Do you have to um, change the places you put the traps, or do you just use the same spot? If it hasn't caught anything for a day or so, we, we look for somewhere else, because after a while, you tend to find the places where the eels, eels like to run. No, I can't see anything there. Nothing. I'm pretty certain that's empty. One down, six more to check. Let's hope we have a bit more luck on the next one. Fishermen were expected to give a proportion of what they caught to the monasteries. Anything else they could keep. Just there, I can see the string entering the water there. We're going to be lucky this time, I yeah, think. Yeah, well, that's my hope. Gosh, there are! Eel! Eel! Yeah! Come on, out you come. Are, are they keen? <laughs> There's one, there it is, look! Gosh, it's hard to see. There's one, there it is. Yes, there's two. Oh, Th oh three! three! Oh my goodness, three! Three? Is he, is he safe in there? I need something to knock him back in oh. with if it does! I can't! <laughs> I'm sorry, it's too snake like, I can't! I was gonna try and be all hard! <laughs> Oh, there you go. <laughs> he was quite sweet when he came out. No, though. there's nothing sweet about it. He liked you. Oh, my toes are all curled now. <sighs> so you're looking forward to catch some more now, are you? <laughs> <laughs> We've only got two more pots left, haven't we? I think so, yes, yeah. Tudor farmers relied on the landscape to provide them with their tools. Cotton grass and other dry plants, such as moss, were used for tinder on fires. As night falls, the natural tinder is put to the test on the smelting furnace. So this can light our kiln, can it? Well, I, th I would think so. Should we just try it? Yeah. Ooh. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> yeah, that, that will do the trick. Let's put a good handful in there. Oh, look at that, it's amazing. It's starting to take hold now, Tom. It's going to go from, say, 20 degrees up to 600 degrees. Could we achieve that kind of temperature just wood? Not so quickly. You know, that extra boost with the white coal is going to you know, be the icing on the cake, really, that final boost to take it from a rock to a molten metal. As the temperature rises, the lead should melt from the rock and trickle down into the hearth at the base. I'll tell you what, this is. This is fierce. <laughs> this is one of the fiercest <laughs> yeah. fires I've ever felt. When you're smelting, can you tell from the colour of the flame what's happening oh, to the yeah. ore? Oh, yeah, very much so. As it starts to drop down, you know, the various gases come off it. 
Can you see that blue? Oh, yeah, just forming up on the right-hand yeah. side, yeah. It's really visible, actually. But after a promising start, things begin to go dangerously wrong. That wind coming up the hill, it's making the fire burn hotter on one side, and it's starting to tilt. We're trying to rectify it with a couple of timbers, but we may not end up smelting all our lead. If they don't work fast, all their hard work will be destroyed. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't disturb the top. Fire has been rescued, for now. You know, it, it's collapsing, but more or less within its own footprint, which is what we wanted. It's definitely reducing as yeah, well, isn't yeah. it? As they reduce in size, there's greater opportunity for the lead to actually go through the gaps into our bowl that we created. At the moment, you know, I'm quite happy the way it's going. The fire will continue to burn overnight. Only in the morning will they find out if it has worked. Lead was one of the most important materials in building medieval cathedrals and churches, and integral to making stained glass. Christians saw light as symbolic of God's power and aimed to build churches that would be open to as much light as possible. Ruth's come to Lincoln Cathedral to meet Glazier Richard Still, who's making stained glass. Let's play about with, with this piece. Right. The first thing that they did was score the glass with a flint. So we've got a bit of wood, we've rubbed it with powdered chalk, and the design's drawn out with just some charcoal. So you can just trace through, because glass being so helpfully yep. see-through. It's very crude and hard to control. And then some little sort of moon-shaped cross-hatching, just to encourage the glass to, to, uh, to break where we would like it to break. OK. So lots of little nibbly yep. sort of... And actually, when Glazier's workshops have been excavated, they've found fragments of glass with these little crosshatch marks on. Have they? So, we, you know, we, we can be quite, quite sure, sure that... this really is uh, the that, technique yeah, that was used. it really used. happened. OK. The next technique is, is even cruder, and it is simply breaking the glass. Um, and it's a case of using this tool. This is, this is a grosing iron. Uh, grosing meaning to crush, and, right. and that's really all we're doing is crushing the edge of the glass. So we're sort of nibbling so away at it. Nibbling away. And that way up. That's so right. More Fingers close. Finger is in close to the edge yep. that we've marked and just nibble. Glass was expensive in Tudor England because producing it was so slow and labour intensive. I'm doing very tiny nibbles because I'm scared stiff. <laughs> <laughs> You're right to be scared. <laughs> <laughs> you can't really put it back once you take it away, can you? You can't. It's, it's a once and forever process. It's so unpredictable, um, so hard to control. A lot of glass must have been broken where you didn't want it to be broken. Mm. I can imagine many an apprentice getting a severely clipped ear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for but, breaking an important and, piece. Yeah, and, and it always breaks just right at the last minute when you think everything's almost perfect. That's looking pretty good, isn't it? It was slow, but it is... But it is a slow process. I'm okay. pretty impressed. In the 1500s, England was producing up to 500 tonnes of lead a year. Tom and Peter are returning to see whether the smelting fire has been successful in producing lead. Ah, oh, wow. Oh, steady. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the remains of our kiln. It's just burnt down to ash. I mean, our clay bowl at the bottom, I thought it was going to break up in the heat, but that's actually just gone solid. That's amazing. Look at the that colour. That is metal. Oh, look. Whoa, look. We've got loads of lead there, Tom. Have you got a bag there, have you? I have. I came prepared. <laughs> so at least one of us did. Whoa, look at that. Look at that. Look at that down get it in the middle. 
The lead must now be refined. Colin has made a refining kiln in the woods. This process requires a much more controlled temperature than smelting, so it must be sheltered from drafts. OK, just tip it in. Yeah. Well, these are called uh, black working hearths or black working ovens because the lead that you brought has got a bit of ash mixed in and there's a, a sort of dark tinge to it. You know, the, the first burn is taking it from the rock. Here we're getting rid of the impurities. The main impurity that's removed is sulphur, driven off as hazardous fumes. OK, Colin. Moment of truth, eh? <laughs> right. It's like Christmas as I unwrap it here. OK, here we go. Nice. While the lead is being refined, the team make moulds for ingots using wet sand. So I'll be gentle, yeah? Yeah. It's almost pumping the bellows and we're taking it in turns to just get this furnace absolutely raging. And the lead, it's coming out the bottom. You can just see it's trickling out like a, a silver stream and he's collecting it in a, a, an iron crucible. And he's just about to pour it into the moulds. So you don't want it spilling all over the place because it burns and it sticks as well. So <laughs> not wishing to put any pressure, but you're in the hot seat. Right. There's peril waiting this. Ooh. In there. Yep. Yeah. OK. Ooh! Yeah. <laughs> right. loose with our legs. Put the rest in there. Yep. The quality appears so much better. It looks cleaner, looks more polished even than it did before it was refined. I know, I, in my mind, lead is not silver. Lead is a, a kind of dull colour, but I suppose that's oxidisation with the air, isn't it? It is. And looking at this, though, it's shiny and it's bright, and it looks like it is worth money. The ingots will weigh just over two pounds and will go towards making a fother, the unit for just over a tonne of lead. It was worth up to eight pounds. Right, I suppose to take our ingots out. Yeah. Oh, they might actually be cold. Yeah, they're kind of warm. They're warm, but... we have got that kind of rough sand indentation on the sides. This is one of the characteristics of sand-casted metal. You get that sort of um, indentation of the sand, which gives it a slightly rougher surface, and it's one of the means of identifying, you know, sort of medieval lead work, really. That has come from that. I oh, know. That was hard work. These were tricky, but ultimately a success. I think we need to get this to the monastery. At the cathedral, Ruth shaped the pieces of stained glass and is returning to complete the panel. Some of the largest and most elaborate windows were commissioned during the medieval period, all held together with lead. A survey at the time estimated that monasteries held some 20,000 fathers of lead. In the 1530s, Henry VIII targeted this valuable material during the dissolution of the monasteries. It was ripped out, melted, and sold. So here's the panel that, that, uh, that, that, that we're working on. Uh -huh. We've got our horseshoe nails um, around. You've cut this piece, this last piece, to go in beautifully, I have to say. So what you're going to do is, is take a piece of lead, and this is the scaffolding that holds the window together. Strips of lead made from ingots were then melted and poured over reeds. This is called <gasps> so lead came, uh, C-A-M-E. I know this seems odd, but it's, it's like modelling in marzipan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of got um, that same... When marzipan's cold, it sort of seems to behave in much the there's, same way. There's a, there's a resistance. There's but, a resistance, but, 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 but not give. that much. Yep. So presumably I need but to get an angle on you, that you, corner you need first. You an angle of 45 degrees. Just there. Yep. And then in. It is just so soft. Is that close that enough to fit? That looks fantastic. Now, what we need to do, let me help here, because I'll put a finger there. 
Right. Uh, and what you're going Ooh, to do nails, yes. is use a couple of nails. To hold. Just to hold. Yeah. And then we have to solder it? We have to solder it. To fuse the lead together, it is soldered by melting another metal onto the join. Animal fat, known as tallow, is applied to the joints first. Yep, perfect. Gosh, it's not much, is it? It's not much. It's just enough for the tallow to melt and form a layer between the air and the lead. Okie doke. You'll probably so find it a little it bit easier. of warming. Yeah. Then touch and let it melt through. Ooh, That's it. That melted through fairly quickly. That's Hold nice. Hold and come straight up. Straight up. That's beautiful. Okay. Fantastic. And fire. Oh, that's made quite a nice little round bead, hasn't yes. it? Yes, so what you've got to remember is that this joint is an integral part of the structure of the window. If this comes apart in five years, or ten years, or fifty years, or a hundred years, <laughs> the window Disaster. falls apart. OK, moment of truth, I suppose. <laughs> Ooh. Is it actually going to hold together? Yeah, and there we go. Mm. What do you think? <laughs> do you like it? Is it a thing of beauty? Well, it's funny, isn't it? Down flat on the board, it looks rather dead and plain. Yeah. But as soon as you've got light coming through it, it seems to sort of come to life. It comes alive, doesn't it? It does. It's yeah. completely different. And, and this handmade glass with its ripples and its bubbles and its imperfections are a part of that. Yeah. It's, it's not just a, a slab of transparent stuff. And, and that's the beauty of the material. <laughs> After three days away at the mine, the boys are returning to the farm. That lead mining's knackered me. <laughs> yeah. I'm a broken man. Well, yeah, you and me both. <laughs> Over we go. Over. Okay. Good girls. On long journeys, travellers would stop to spend the evening at an inn, where their animals could also be housed for the night. Monks saw it as their Christian duty to provide hospitality to travellers. Monasteries with land on major pilgrimage and trade routes also seized this as a business opportunity, building inns which could be leased out for revenue. Ah, welcome to the inn. What's your drinks order? Water? 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 Ale. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to come in with you, aren't I? You are. OK, Let's girls, you've done well. We'll be back in a bit. And see how much parking costs. Inns were busy places, bringing together the old and the young. Sometimes preachers could hope to capture an audience. Priests give themselves to feasting and banqueting, spend themselves in vain babbling. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Inns like this were originally designed to be accommodation blocks. But having built them for that purpose, they quickly became spaces that really lent themselves to public speaking, such as our friar is doing, and, and to entertainments too. And this shape forms a sort of natural auditorium and informs the architecture of theatres for generations to come. Are drowned in the delights of this world, patronise those who cater for their pleasure. A wide range of social functions would take place at the inn, from religious to commercial. It was a microcosm of Tudor life. Cheers. Cheers, Ruth. Cheers. Well, it's good to be in a pub. It's such a familiar sort of thing to be doing, too, isn't it? It's like going to a hotel and a pub all sort of rolled into one. I mean, you, if you could hire a room at a place like this for your private party, you could have your wedding reception here, yeah. you know, or a christening party. Business meetings. Loads of people came to inns for business meetings, which really makes sense, doesn't it? You know? well, I guess they're on the same routes as trade. Trade routes, exactly. roads, roads. They're on so all the major roads, and constant. they're in the hearts of, of major towns and market centres where people are coming together anyway. So, of course, you have your business meeting at these yeah. sorts of places. It's a conference centre. Yeah. <laughs> Inns were also places to have fun, and drinking games were popular, such as the Puzzle Cup. Can you drink out of that without spilling it? <laughs> it looks like men's work. <laughs> 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 Oh, 
<laughs> For a second there, I thought it was amazing. Was that... You have a go, you have a go. Oh! oh. That work. No. No. Is there a hole under there as well? They're ready to use. Oh, yeah. Okay, so these puzzle cups. Yeah. yeah. Oh, here we go. A little hole. <laughs> yeah, I found that bit. You have to cover up with your yeah, hands. Yeah, I managed to do that. that. Vacuum. Yeah. And then... Ready? We're ready. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you as well! Epic fail. <laughs> oh, there's a beer everywhere now. Bring us in good For a blessed lady's sake, bring us in good <laughs> Accommodation could vary depending on your budget, from communal rooms to private suites. Well, this is nice. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm having a little bit. Bad. One's big and one's little. Most in-rooms were crowded places. If you were a single chap travelling, you would expect to share the bed with somebody else um, who might be a complete stranger. Oh, if only I had that luxury. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, They're not exactly down. bouncy, are they, these beds? They're all right, though. So Matches. what kind of quality are we dealing with? Here? This, this is pretty good for an inn, this is. How many stars are we looking at here? Four. Four. I can see them through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> No, go on. Move over. Move over. <laughs> Very Morecambe and Wise. Make a wish, Tomo. It's your lucky night. <sighs> Peter, Let's... get your knee out of my back. Shut up over there! It's late July, a time when farmers need to keep a close eye on their crops as they neared harvest. Tudor farmers would also use this time for haymaking, weeding, and checking the progress of young animals who would provide valuable income later in the year. The woodlands owned by monasteries were a perfect place to rear young pigs. Tenants would seek rights from their monastic landlords to pasture pigs in the forest, known as pannage. The team's six piglets have been foraging in the woods for a couple of weeks. Peter and pig farmer Neil Careswell have come to check on their progress. Pig, pig, pigs! You reckon they'll come to our call? Oh, I think so. I think so. Hey, piggies! Here we go. Piggy! Piggies! Pig, pigs! Right there. Look how big they've become. They have grown Fantastic. up faster. Fantastic! God, they've done, they've done a, well. They've done a good job of clearing this woodland. Not only do the acorns and roots provide rich sustenance for the piglets, but their foraging also clears the undergrowth, allowing young trees in the woodland to thrive. But that's what they would have used them for. They're, they're you know, fantastic excavators. They would have pushed them into sort of land like this, and you've noticed they've not touched any of the coppicing wood, so they'll clear everything else. Um, and then you know, the woodman used to be able to come in, and it was ready for them. Pork was in great demand by both the monasteries and the lay community, as pigs were inexpensive to keep and the meat easy to preserve. Keeping pigs was a useful money spinner for the ambitious Tudor farmer. Our Tudor farming Bible. So you got your Bible? A book of husbandry. <laughs> What's it say, then? Well, you tell me. <laughs> I find it hard to read. Right, OK. For it is an old saying mm -hmm. that he hath both sheep, sheep, swine and bees. Sheep, swine and bees. Got, got, got. He may thrive because he hath these things that most profit of in, in shortest space of time. This is basically saying we'll get the most amount of profit out of these guys yep. for the least amount of investment. By scavenging like this, a piglet could grow quickly, allowing the farmer to slaughter them young. So a Tudor farmer couldn't sustain these pigs through winter on feed, but a Tudor farmer could sustain himself, I suppose, on the the meat from the pigs. Definitely. They would have looked at trying to get as much slaughtered and as much preserved, dried, smoked uh, and stored, ready for the winter, rather than feed the animal through the winter. Yeah. Definitely. 
These guys, I mean, are they ready to slaughter you? Um, you can check. You can have a, a feel of their spine. You go along their spine and just have a feel of the two fillets either side. Yeah. If the spine's very, very protruding, then yeah. you know it's underweight. Uh, and these guys are fine. You know, there's no, no bones sticking out. Yeah. They're, they're, they're good size. They're very, uh, they're <laughs> very boisterous. That's always a good sign. But no, I think we've got a, a while to go yet. Ow. <laughs> Obviously still hungry, though. I feel a bit like the witch out of Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> <laughs> How fat are you? I call it going on holiday, so we'll maybe use yeah. that term from now on so they don't hear <laughs> yeah. us. Hey, chaps. But I think we're really, really on target. They're looking fantastic. <laughs> The farmhouse was not just where the farmer, his family and staff lived. It was also a business centre where deals were made and meetings were held. So Ruth's considering some home improvements. Appearances were important and aspirational farmers would want to emulate the tastes of wealthy Tudors through their decorations. At the top end of society, people really enjoyed bold, strong colour and pattern, and they covered their walls in fabrics, in paintings. The most expensive thing that you could have in your palace, in your castle, in your abbot's lodging, was a tapestry. So, as somebody of more modest means, imitating tapestry was a really <laughs> socially, upwardly mobile sort of thing to do. So many people went to the painters or stainers in order to achieve it. And a stainer is somebody who paints on cloth. To produce a wall hanging for the farmhouse, Ruth's visiting artist Mark Goodman in his workshop. The materials used by stainers were sourced from their surroundings. So the, pa the pigments, they, they vary. So you've got cheap ones. Um, for example, that's just a red ochre. That's just a clay. That's actually just dug out of the ground. It's relatively right, cheap. So I can, so can have any sort of brown colour for very little. Yeah, reds, browns, yellows, those sorts of colours. And the more interesting one is lead white. And so obviously lead mined. Mm. Uh, but then to get it into that form there, soaking it in vinegar and then making sure it's coated in vinegar steam for about three to four weeks. And then oh, right, white. you get those little white crystals yeah. on the top. Pigments were mixed with glue made from boiled animal fat, known as size or distemper. Once the paint has been made, it needs to be kept warm to prevent the glue from solidifying. Seems really weird, doesn't it, having to keep your glue, your paint hot? Mm, yes. <laughs> and you, you, you notice when it's not, because it just doesn't It just work. doesn't flow, does it? You are just sort of more or less putting one layer on and staining the canvas. You're not yes. sort of building up layers like an yeah. oil painter would do. So these can be just churned out. Th these can be uh, created very quickly. Scenes from mythology and folklore were popular on wall hangings. Ruth's helping Mark produce a stain of George and the Dragon. It's a bit paint by numbers, this, isn't it? Yeah, it's a cartoon. Yeah, but we're not going to do it so... Uh, we're not going to try and make it realistic or put a lot of effort into making it realistic. That takes time, obviously, and hence uh, costs more. So this one's just going to be some nice bright colours. We'll put a little uh, bit of shading in in various places, and that's about it, really. In the 1500s, portraiture was moving away from stylized caricatures. This period saw a transition where more realistic art developed and flourished during the Renaissance. It also brought about advancements in technology, Changes were made to the ancient Camera Obscura. Tom is sitting for the artist Sigrid Holmwood to experiment with this technique. OK, Tom, so I think you might have to come a little bit closer, if you a can. A little bit closer. Yeah. Oh, no, too close. A bit <laughs> further away. That's it. OK, great. Stay still. OK, so what you need to make a Camera Obscura is firstly a darkened room. Camera obscura actually means dark room. Um, and then you block out the window um, and you put a hole in it. Daylight bounces off Tom and passes through a lens which flips the image upside down onto the parchment. Early camera obscuras used a pinhole to project the image onto the canvas. But in the Tudor period, lenses were adopted for the first time, making the image brighter and clearer. Even the tiniest movement shows up a lot on this. I'm going to see how this looks soon. 
but I've got a feeling we might have to try it again. OK, Tom, the thing is, you moved a bit. Um, move now. Yeah, you can move now. <laughs> <laughs> Just so checking. You didn't manage to get your nose. It's gone all weird. Yeah. Um, Must be like also, a witch or something. Yeah, exactly. And um, your whole head's a bit compressed. Um, because you probably moved in one direction after I'd done that. So, I've been trying um... to lose weight, so... <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the way to do it. They need a way of keeping Tom still. What and we're you know, sure this is my fault, this one. <laughs> <laughs> you need to... It's just like back. Victorian photography. You need to be as still as possible. OK, great, that's looking much better now. OK, keep still! It's like a race against time. OK, so in this case, um, we've got his nose and his eyes and his mouth really nicely in focus, but actually his ear and the top of his head and his hat are kind of receding and quite fuzzy. You've got this area of focus in the centre, and then you've got this area around the outside which gets out of focus, and this creates distortions in scale. It's quite controversial um, amongst our historians how much the camera obscura was used by artists in the past. There's a lot of resistance to the idea because people think it's cheating. I certainly feel that it was used more than people think. This is a bit like being at the dentist. The moment you're told not to move, everything itches. You can feel insects on your face that probably aren't there. You want to cough, but, uh, yeah, it's nice to sit down on the farm rather than be working, sort of. In the last few weeks, the farm's kitchen garden has burst into life. But unlike modern gardens, the Tudor farmer would have let the weeds thrive as well, because they too had their uses. Now, this little patch here is actually my crop. It may look like a weed patch, but it isn't. This is cleavers, and I'm deliberately growing it. I know for many people who spend half their lives trying to take it out of their garden, this may seem madness. But this is my cleavers crop. And it's useful because, well, you can eat it. Again, it's not delicious, but it, it's all right. But it's also really useful as a, a filter or sieve. If you lay the stems one way and then you lay them the other, you get a really useful filter, which you can use in the dairy, you can use in your brewing, use in your kitchen. Ruth is also letting the weeds flourish amongst her vegetables. Think about this lovely set of beans. If only half of them are germinated, and I'd done a really good job of the weeding, I'd end up with some empty, dead ground. But I need to eat all year. I need a meal out of this patch every single day of the year. Many of the weeds that have grown are edible, particularly important to the Tudor farmer when the main food crops aren't yet ready to be harvested. The fat hen. This one's not just put up a ball with. This one's actually quite nice. I quite like fat hen. There's also land cresses in amongst all here. Quite a lot of land cress, actually. And the point is that early on in the process, I allow the weeds a little bit of leeway. And only when I know I've got an established crop will I start taking them out. The land cress and fat hen Ruth's picking will become a Tudor salad. With the outline of the image completed, Sigrid can now paint the portrait. If the camera obscura doesn't actually give you the whole picture, as it were, how come you don't just paint me from scratch? Well, it's a lot easier to correct something that's already down there than start entirely from scratch. Um, but most importantly, um, it's, the, it's the relationship between your eyes, your nose and your mouth, and the very subtle little shapes there which really make the difference in getting a likeness. So the camera obscura is almost like a stencil from which you start your work? Yeah, it's a starting point. You really need to still have lots of drawing skills, lots of artistic judgment um, to be able to use it properly. Um, it's not like taking a snapshot. It isn't that easy to use. Painting was viewed as a craft rather than art in Tudor England, but that would change with the influx of artists from Europe. So would artists travel from like village to village looking for work or in terms of portraiture, there would actually be artists would travel from country to country. So there were a lot of um, artists from the Low Countries that travelled to London and were commissioned to do portraits. So, for example, is Holbein. 
Um, so he's a little bit later than our period, more active around the 1530s, but he was from Germany and came to London. And when I look at Holbein's drawings, I think they probably were used, done using a camera obscura. There's little telltale signs. For instance, there's a very large head and then with incredibly small shoulders coming off it. During this period, the Mona Lisa was completed. And artists strove to mirror the soul of the sitter in their work. During this time, you start to get a shift towards a more humanist philosophy, um, where you start to look for God in nature and start to look for God in man. And so therefore, it becomes much more important um, to try and capture what things look like naturally. It's actually much more people's views changing, and then it makes their art change. Art would decorate the walls of Tudor dining rooms, and fish would dominate the tables. Ruth has brought her eels back to the farmhouse to make the most of this delicacy. So now I've got to get the slime off my eels. Like all freshwater fish, they have a sort of protective slime coating. Salt, rubbing and water. I hate this bit. Mm. Oh, I don't know why it is, but the slime on freshwater fish makes me more squeamish, I think, than anything else. Look at that. Ugh. Freshwater fish was hard to come by for people living away from rivers and was only eaten on feast days. It's one of those differences, really, between the monastic community and the lay community. People like us, eels are an occasional treat. In the monasteries, they're almost a staple. For us, fish means salt fish, <laughs> salt cod. It means pickled fish, it means pickled herring. In the monasteries, fresh fish is possible and indeed quite probable on a daily basis. Ruth is cooking the eels as part of a stew known as brewit. She makes a sauce from parsley, breadcrumbs and beer, which gives the dish its name. Getting the texture right is half the battle. The eels are cooked separately and added to the sauce later. Cooked like this, you can see why I've left the skin on. It gives me perfect, organised little gobbets of meat. I love that word. <laughs> it is the period word. The stock from the eels is added for flavour. It does upset me that when you're watching this, you'll be judging it entirely on what it looks like as opposed to what it tastes and smells like. This isn't posy telly food. This is real food and it tastes great and it smells fantastic. Fresh fish may have been a treat for the farmer, but pork was widely eaten at both the top and bottom of Tudor society. Fat was an essential commodity, particularly for monasteries that used it for cooking, candle making, and even shining their shoes. To make money and keep up with demand, the farm must have a continuous supply of pigs. A few weeks ago, their boar Turkish was introduced to the sows. This Turkish here have to fancy the pigs he <laughs> makes with? No, not necessarily. A boar will follow his, his red-blooded uh, primeval instincts. A sow would be introduced to a boar before reaching a year old, and a farmer would regularly check for signs of pregnancy. A positive indicator is when she doesn't show signs of wanting to mate. This is easily tested by the farmer. There's the standing heat test. Right. Do you know anything about no. that? No. Which is putting all your weight on their, on their back Point hips, quarters, yeah. um, which sort of simulates mounting of the ball, and they will stand, so they will sort of position themselves, get themselves in a position where they're, they're, they're ready to, to be served. So should we give it a go? We can give it a go. Yeah. Are you, you're comfortable with that? So we, we don't want them to stand if we put our weight here. Yeah, if you put their weight there and they... they... Oh. See, I don't think she is. I mean, she's... Oh, no, sorry. she's not, she's not comfortable she's, with she's that. She's looking so. for her food. Yeah. She's not really interested in what I'm doing. Have a, have a, have a go with Georgie, because I think Georgie's um, looking a bit more of a surefire. Are you all right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that, then, eh? I'm after your women, Turkish. Oh, no, Turkish is a bit confused now. Competition. <laughs> <laughs> Asari's pregnant for just under four months and the farmer would want her to give birth before winter to give the piglets a better chance of survival. Timing was critical. Oh, 
No, he's a he's a he's a good boy, and I think you I think you're probably right. I think he's done his job. Yeah. I think he has done his job. Keep an eye on it. After all their exertions, the team has returned to the newly decorated farmhouse. Supper was usually served at 5 p.m. and was normally a simple affair of pottage with vegetables. But tonight, the boys are in for a treat. Here we go, a bit of a treat. Eel, look. Mm. Fresh water nice. fish. Fresh water fish. I'll get involved. Good salsa protein, good for the brain. Yeah. Uh, brain. <laughs> Something of a luxury. There we go. This yeah. is lovely. Yeah, it's, it's good, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it's good. I like brew it. It's a nice change. It is a nice change. And it also represents quite a, a luxury dish, really, for lay people. Because to own the fish, you have to own the rights to the ponds and the rivers. And tenants very rarely do. That's all landowners, not tenants like us. Don't you think, you know, everything we've sort of done in the last couple of weeks, it's all been under monastic control, hasn't it? Yeah, and You know, also... I mean, even that inn we stayed in was yeah. owned by the monastery. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought that was one of the best things we've done. I really enjoyed that. And all these stresses of the farm and the pressure from the monastery wasn't quite there, but we were still part of that monastic picture. Well, I can't help notice that, you know, while I've been away, <laughs> we've adorned the place with some beautiful artwork, very feminine night there. <laughs> Is that you? I think I look noble. Yeah, well, you, you certainly, you got that. You're staring off into the distance. A thousand yards stare. Thinking about farming. <laughs> <laughs> Next time on Tudor Monastery Farm, the team go to work for the monastery, restoring accommodation. This is going to be. This is going to be a fantastic floor. I can feel it. Washing their linens. It's the bashing that does it. And learning the art of monastic hospitality. I want to stress, I did not drop the custard castle. <laughs> <laughs> In the early 1500s, no help for the poor was available from the state. Those in need relied solely on the charity and hospitality of others. Hospitality was a vital social virtue, the measure by which any good Christian would be judged. And at the heart of this culture of hospitality and giving were the monasteries. Beyond their gates, they ran almshouses, and within the monastery, they accommodated everyone from the destitute traveler to the wealthiest noble. For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. 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 James, can I interest you in some pottage? Well, I'm sure it's good for the soul. <laughs> Monastic expert Professor James Clark is joining the team for a meal. Did the monasteries do much entertaining or hospitality? Absolutely. It's really central to the monastery's service to society. The charity, that is, in the strict sense, loving kindness to your, your fellow man, is really at the heart of the monastic vocation. At the lower end, it would be akin to a kind of backpackers' hostel. But at the other end of the scale, for the most distinguished guests, there would be really lavish accommodation and uh, food would be laid on. For the monks, hosting an esteemed guest wasn't just hospitable, it was profitable. Entertaining nobility was an excellent way to encourage large donations to the monastery. The nobles believed that supporting a monastery would guarantee that they went straight to heaven when they died. The abbot is planning a feast for a wealthy patron, and James is enlisting the team's help to prepare for the visit. Well, I have some particular tasks in mind for you. Uh, there's going to be a lot of preparing of bed linen, so that does mean laundry. <laughs> <laughs> no lucky, escaping lucky the laundry. Me. And there could well be a uh, need for some assistance in the kitchen, um, because uh, lavish meals are expected, um, nice as pottage is. <laughs> as well as monks and workers, the monastery also accommodated other members of society on a permanent basis. Part of the monastery's remit was to provide care for some of the elderly, their retired staff, 
or their most generous donors. James is enlisting the team to renovate a room in the outer precinct of the monastery as part of something known as a corridy. A corridy is a grant which is really like a kind of pension. It provides an individual with accommodation and food over the course of a year, and the monastery might grant that to one of their long-serving um, lay servants. And after 20 or 30 years' service, instead of a gold watch, um, they're granted this corridy, which is really going to give them uh, room and board to live out their, their days in their, their right. twilight years. So it's going to need a bit of renovation, really. I mean, this floor's in quite yes, a state now. Yes, this floor is, is um, looking past its best. It's worth remembering, of course, that they expect something of high quality. This is a valuable um, retirement home. I'll have a chat with the boys, especially about the floor, see what we can do. Before the boys set to work on renovations, they must attend to an urgent matter on the farm. The pea crop. Well, if we look closely, we've still got a crop. That is fantastic. Oh, yes, please. That is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> How does it taste? Good. Taste of summer. Peas were important in Tudor England as both food and animal fodder. Unlike garden peas, field peas were left to dry on the plant until they were harvested. It made them easier to store, but also vulnerable to birds. This is the thing, if we start drying this crop out here, all the birds are going to be looking at it and going, they've laid on a pea buffet. Let's get in there. Yeah, it's going to be a proper feast. Bird control was a serious business. In the later Tudor period, bounty payments of a penny for three birds' heads were offered. And farmers often employed children to frighten away the pigeons and rooks. Tom and I are erecting a bird scare. We're putting in hazel poles. And we're going to tie some string between them. And onto that string, we're going to hang some shells. Tudor-style wind chimes. So this be gentle. Yes. Well, that was work, that was. So we're taking advantage of the wind making sure all the shells just bounce off of each other, making some noise. That's the thing, being a Tudor farmer or being any farmer, you can't afford to lose a crop, but especially in Tudor times, these peas were your sustenance. Right, I'm going to stick another stake in, Tom. Am I going to get in trouble if I walk across the pea crop? If you don't walk, the birds will eat. I'll be delicate. Ruth has begun preparations for the abbot's feast, starting by making butter for the table. Now, the reason I've transferred my milk into these dishes is to help the cream separate. Anybody who's a little bit older remembers the days before homogenised milk, and they remember that in milk bottles, it always used to rise, and you always used to get a bit of cream on the very top. That's what's happening here. Each day, a new bowl of milk was settled and Ruth is starting to process yesterday's batch. Look, see how thick that cream is? Super thick, look at that. Not only was butter an important source of calories, it was also considered good for the health and a cure for chest complaints. Led on to minimise splashing. Hear that? Knowing what stage you're at is all about listening to the sounds that it makes in the churn. And now, it's all a matter of time. A volume of cream like this can turn into butter in as little as 15 to 20 minutes. Butter, along with other dairy produce, was known as a white meat, most commonly consumed by poorer members of society. After all, everyone had a cow. The point was you could graze a cow even if you had no land yourself. You could graze it on the common land. You had a right to put a cow on the common, which meant that you had access to some milk. 
you could make your own butter, you could make your own cream, you could make your own cheese. White meats, therefore, were a very democratic food. Everybody had them. And the rich sneered. But dairy produce wasn't the preserve of the poor for long. By 1500, landowners were taking back farmland, and also common land, to establish parks for hunting. It meant peasants could no longer graze their animals for free. Now you've got to actually rent a field to keep your cow on. And that meant that increasingly, from 1500 onwards, cows and cow's milk became something associated with the wealthier sort of peasant. It all feels a little bit stiffer, so I'm really listening now. really predict whether it's seconds away or another five minutes. <sighs> we Did you hear? Suddenly it sounds wetter. That noise has changed, doesn't it? Oh, yes, look at that. Now, that looks good. There we are, look, butter. The final stage is to squeeze all the butter particles into a solid lump. Now, obviously, doing this with your hands, there's a problem. The warmth of your hands starts to melt the butter. So, instead, one uses a pair of wooden hands. Once the buttermilk is removed, Ruth adds salt, which is a preservative. And indeed, if I put enough salt in it, I can even make a product that can survive for a full year in an edible, not necessarily a tasty, but in an edible fashion. Well, what kind of trouble do you think Ruth has got us into now? Oh, you never know with Ruth, do you? Oh, dear. Peter and Tom are keen to get on with their monastic restoration project. And the priority is laying a new floor. It'll be made from a mixture of lime putty and ash, known as lime ash, which was strong, flexible and a good heat insulator. The boys have come to collect some limestone from the forest to produce their own lime putty. This is the key ingredient to our floor. It's chalk, we're gonna heat it up. That's gonna dry off the carbon dioxide. We're gonna put that in water, that'll turn it into a putty. Then we're gonna lay it in our floor. And as it dries out and reabsorbs carbon dioxide, it's gonna turn back into chalk, back into a stone and make our floor absolutely solid. To turn the limestone into the lime and ash mixture needed for the floor, it must be roasted at a temperature of over 900 degrees Celsius. Just need to make sure that every piece of that chalk hits that magic number of 900 degrees. Chalk, or limestone, was hugely popular as a building material in the Tudor era. While the Anglo-Saxons had built with wood, the Tudors needed lime to make mortar for their stone-built castles, city walls and churches. Lime ash was normally gathered from the bottom of kilns where limestone was burnt. Lime kilns really take off in the Tudor period, and that's the reason why in 1500 there's a massive surge in the fashion for lime ash floors. However, farmers like us, who might not be too close to a lime kiln, could make their own, such as this. It's a real crossover in technology. In Tudor England, the shadow of plague and disease was ever-present. People worked hard to keep a clean living environment. There were even systems for waste removal. Centuries before germs were discovered, 
Cleaning was a surprisingly rigorous affair, especially in the dairy. With the butter made, Ruth needs to wash her equipment. A Tudor housewife had three lines of defence in her battle for hygiene in the dairy, and not one of them included soap. First and foremost came salt. Used with a damp cloth, it helps to scrub, but it also, of course, kills bacteria. She then turned to the second line of defence, boiling water. All the dairy utensils were finished off by being scalded over all of their surfaces. And her last line of defence was sunlight. More specifically, the UV element of sunlight. She might not have known why it worked, but she knew that it did. In fact, the UV kills bacteria. So on a nice day like today, you'd have seen a very common sight outside any woman's dairy. All her dairy utensils lined up in the sun, getting a good sterilising dose of sunlight. The limestone has been roasting for three hours, driving off carbon dioxide and leaving a highly volatile product called quicklime. It's then put in water for a process known as slaking. So if we just pop that in. There it goes, look at it. Look, oh, look at amazing. that. It appears to have worked. If I bring that back up, there we go, look at that. Oh, that's the dangerous bit. So that is, that is lime slaking, and it's turning into a putty. The fire drives off all the carbon dioxide, and it makes uh, the chalk very, very volatile. When it goes in the water, uh, the water is absorbed, and there's an exothermic reaction. So this isn't the heat from the fire that's doing this. This is the chemical reaction that's heating up this water, and you can hear it, and it's slowly turning into a putty. Look at that. That is lime putty on my shovel. The lime will continue to slake in the water overnight. In 1500, the shape of England's waterways and wetlands was unrecognisable from today. Before the extensive land drainage of the later 16th century, these regions provided a wealth of resources, from fish and wildfowl to peat used for fuel, and something without which no Tudor home would have been complete, rushes. Hi, Linda. Oh, hi, Ruth. <laughs> Ruth has come to meet rush worker Linda Lemieux. The rushes they harvest will be made into floor mats for the room the team are renovating. Rushes are a rather ignored resource in modern Britain, aren't they? Yeah. You look at the domestic interiors of the late 15th and early 16th century and you can spot rushes here, there and everywhere. At Tudor England, they use them for their mattresses, their chair seats, their cushions. Their flooring. Their flooring. <laughs> Hats. Yep. Baskets. Yeah. Rushes were commonly cut between May and September, as near to midsummer as possible. Because it's a harvest, we've got to do it in a certain four or five weeks of the year. That's all we've got. All oh, right. So, th these will all die down. If you come to the river in, in October, you won't see a thing. Right. And you come to the river in April, you won't see a thing. So they all die down right back into their rhizome in the mud. Before Ruth finishes harvesting the rushes, she'll need a decent floor to put them on. Peter and Tom are combining their lime ash putty with sand, clay and flint to give the mixture strength. This is really good, our lime putty. Mixed with the ash, 
The boys are adding a special ingredient to bind their floor. Whoa. Curdled milk. Does that smell you or the milk? Ah, it's a little bit of both, Tom. I mean, that should go as the floor ages, so we don't have to worry about it too much. Used in concretes like this since Roman times, sour milk contains a protein called casein, which bonds with the lime to make it durable and waterproof. We're like tiny little bakers making a giant cake, aren't we? Once all the ingredients are combined, they can start to lay the floor. If we just get it in there and stamp it down, and then flatten it off later with spades. It's feeling good. Feeling good. It's getting there. I'm glad they're not too heavy. <laughs> yeah, no, good harvest we got here. <laughs> now it's cutting. Good boy. good boy. Before the rushes can be used, they must be dried out. We, if we use them straight, they're so brittle that they'll just snap straight away like that. Oh, yeah. So what, what you have to do is let the cell structure dry out. So here's a couple that I cut about five weeks ago. And now they don't snap. And if I try and just tear that, I can't. To make the floor mats, the rushes must be plaited together. I'll hold it for you. Just okay. over. Under, that's right. Uh, I like the feel that's developing there. Yeah, that's, that's tough, isn't it? That's strong, but it's still got a certain soft and bounciness to it. Now, if you imagine your mattress might need about 100 feet of this plat. <laughs> <laughs> Should we do a kid's one? <laughs> Hygiene dictated that the floor mats be replaced every year. So there was scarcely a time when plaiting rushes wasn't on the to-do list. It's the final push to finish the renovations. The boys are polishing the floor with milk to give it a hard, waterproof coating. This is going to be, this is going to be a fantastic floor. I can feel it. And Ruth has almost completed the sleeping mats. I've made loads of the plats. I shall probably have to make some more, but still. And then I'm sewing them together into a mat. This floor looks so much better. It's not bad, is I it? I think you made a really good job. Oh, thank you. Right, where do you want your mats? Oh, yeah, stick them out of the way for a minute, because I've got to get the hygiene to sort out first. OK. I've got a whole load of herbs to scatter on the floor. And they serve two basic functions. The first thing is about smell. People in this period believed that disease was carried by evil miasmas, by bad smells in the air. And if you breathed that evil miasma, you would get sick. So wherever you lived, wherever you were spending time, you wanted it to smell as sweet and clean as possible. But then there's also a role for insecticides. Things like my tansy and my wormwood, flea bane, they're for keeping insects out of the house. Things like flies or ants or, or body lice, fleas, anything like that can be driven out. And it will make the whole living experience not only healthier, but much pleasanter. Do you want to stick these mats down then? I've got a little lay down. Yeah. In addition to the room and a provision of food, the corridor might include firewood and some cooking equipment. Is that the last one? Yeah. I think the floor makes a huge difference. You know, this is easy to keep clean, to look after, to be comfy, isn't it? Mm. Home sweet home. Yeah. The influence of the church on the people of Tudor England extended far beyond its role as landlord and welfare provider. They also controlled the spread of ideas. Major centres of learning with extensive libraries, the monasteries were the custodians of knowledge. Monasteries commissioned deluxe books 
costly and prestigious objects as gifts for their most distinguished patrons. And Tom will be making one to present at the abbot's feast. Historically, books had been written on vellum, a material made from calfskin. But by 1500, another medium had taken over, paper. Expert Jim Patterson is showing Tom how paper was produced. What we've got in here is a mixture of linen uh, and water. They're the ingredients for Tudor paper making. You would start off with, with waste rag, it would be a recycling process, and that's the pulp that would result. So there's no wood involved at all? None whatsoever, not till much, much later in history. Uh, now you're going to form a sheet on a hand mould. OK. There we are, by dipping it in below the surface, go in oh, like that. that that's way. it, that's it. Okay. In you go, below the surface, flood the, the mould and bring it up. Clear of the, bring it clear of the, the vat. Up, now shake it, forward, yeah. back, side forward to side. Forward and back. Can you see? Right. Side to side, forward, back. And you'll see the sheet actually forming and it's leaving the fibre on the surface. A little bit uneven. <laughs> <laughs> Should I go again? No, I think that'll pass for Tudor paper. I think <laughs> and the next stage is couching from the French couche de lait. Just placing that on there. That's right. Bring it up right. This was the job for the assistant. This was the non-technical. <laughs> non-technical. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. I'm just going to roll that and down. Roll it from one hand to the other, and it should come away. Now nah, oh. you see, you see. It's not uh, as easy as it looks. Not enough weight. Okay, <laughs> we'll make another one. But okay. More weight next time. D dig, dig in deep. The first paper mill in England was established around 1490, but at the time, paper was mainly imported from Europe, making it extremely costly. Firmly and with confidence. With confidence, sir and manufacturers could be recognised by their watermarks. Not too bad. There's quite a deep indentation here. When the paper's pressed, that will pretty much all come down to the same thickness, and you really shouldn't be able to see it on the surface, but when you hold it up to the light, the displaced fibres will, will show as a watermark. The paper is pressed for an hour. We'll uh, take the press off now and okay. see what we've got. Quite excited by this. After 50 years, the novelty wears off. <laughs> That's the first of our bits of paper. That's brilliant. Of and you can see the watermark. Paper making Tudor style. <laughs> Thank you very much. The daily running of the monasteries required many lay workers, leaving the monks free for worship, prayer or study. Usually these workers were men, but certain jobs were open to older women. Considered by the monks to be beyond the temptations of the flesh, they helped with gardening, cooking and the washing of linens. Which is what Ruth has been commissioned to do. My main cleaning chemical throughout all my housework is wood ash. It's particularly good at dealing with grease, with dissolving it so that you can wash it away. But when you're doing the laundry, you don't necessarily want pure ash in your best napkins. So what I'm going to do is filter the chemical within the ash out into a nice clean liquid. Inside a bucket with a hole in the bottom, Ruth makes a filter of river gravel and straw and then the ash just goes on top. And this is, you know, just out of the fireplace. And then I just need to pour some water through. And let that seep through, leaching out every last bit of chemical into a really strong lye solution. The word lye, after all, is just a short form of alkali. With Tom and Ruth attending to monastic matters, Peter is keeping the farm running. The cows have eaten all the grass 
and there is a shortage of food. To source a Tudor solution, Peter has come to meet Ted Green, who looks after the woodlands at Nepp Castle in West Sussex. Hi, Ted. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad. How are you? Well, really, really pleased because I've just found this uh, tree which is going to really work for a ladder for us. You're making a ladder out of this tree? Yeah. Oh, Christ. Well, then, there you go. <laughs> I'll bring the tools. You bring the tools. I'll bring the ladder. Straight in front of you. Ted is reviving an ancient farming practice which has existed ever since animals were domesticated. Harvesting hay from trees. It's a perfect solution for the dry months. As trees keep their leaves hydrated, so the hay will provide a good source of moisture. It's something which actually predates grass. It's only in modern times that people start thinking about grass. Animals never, never ate only grass. We made them eat grass. Which trees are we looking at cutting? In this particular case, we've got two trees which are ash, which they absolutely love. It's yeah. one of the top trees for animals. Right, I've been lugging this ladder around long oh, enough. Okay. Where Let's... do you want it? Well, we're going to try and rest it in that tree. Right. Just see how you go. Here we go. No no, 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 no. Over your way a bit. Over. That's it, you're in. Great, I don't mind that. Go on, try it. I'm not overly convinced about this. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, right. Um. So you're up. Yeah, for now. OK. So what am I going for here, Ted? What am I looking for? This year's growth, which should have leaves right down the stem to near the trunk. That's brilliant. That one? And that's a, good, that's a good size as well. That's lovely for, for storing. These leaves, Ted, so they're, they're gonna, are they gonna hold their nutrients? Yep, yep, that because we're cutting on this time of the year. Obviously, when they fall off in the autumn, the tree has put all the minerals and nutrients back into itself. But by doing this, we're trapping them all in the, in the leaves. Unlike coppicing, where material is cut from the base of the tree, harvesting tree hay like this is known as pollarding. The leaves are cut and regrow above the height of the animal's head, which meant farmers could control the crop. It was one of the earliest forms of woodland management. Well, Pete, that looks like you got most of it off to me. Yeah, I think so. Wonderful. As well as laundering the linen for the upcoming abbot's feast, Ruth is also tackling some more personal garments. While most lay people had little time for bodily hygiene, for monks, washing was a matter of religious discipline, demanded before meals and the duties of the day. Having clean clothes was essential. According to the rule of St. Benedict, a monk was supposed to wear his woolen tunic next to his skin. Then he had his woolen scapula over it, a woolen gown and a woolen hood. But by 1500, lay people wouldn't have dreamed of wearing wool next to the skin. They all wore linen underwear, something that could be laundered regularly. And the monks wanted some of that comfort and cleanliness themselves. So there are records of monks buying underwear. And there are also records of them having it laundered. So I've put a load of um, sheets in. If I just keep piling up and up and up and up until the basket's full, it'll all compress down and I have real difficulty getting my lye to move between. So once I've got a layer, I make a shelf. The shelf will support the next layer of linen saving the bottom layer from being crushed. So now it's the moment for my extra strong lye. I pour this lye on, it's going to slowly filtrate its way through all the greasy, dirty things, dissolving any grease that's there. So on it goes. Tom is overseeing the production of a book which the abbot will present to his patron at the feast. 
In medieval England, hand-copied books were still a precious commodity, mainly the preserve of nobility and the monasteries. But by the reign of Henry VII, a new technology from the continent was changing this, the printing press with movable type. Developed by a German craftsman, Johannes Gutenberg, the press allowed individual letters to be set into text and rearranged with ease. Printing expert Nick Smith is setting the type for the abbot's book. So when you put these letters in, you're not actually putting them in as you would read them? No, the letter on the end of the piece of type is going to be upside down and backwards as far as the compositor is concerned. So he has to be able to read a line like that just to check that there are no errors in it. And that, of course, means that when it's turned over, inked and pressed into paper, it'll come out the right way around. Printers used to refer to these types of sorts. If you run out of the uh, stock of a particular character, you can say you're out of sorts. Once a page of type is set, it is carefully transferred to a metal frame called a chase and held in place with wedges known as furniture. Those letters move in a millimetre, it becomes a smudge. You lose it does, it. yes. You can't afford to have the type moving at all. Um, in fact, some of the inks we use are so sticky that if a type is at all loose, the sticky ink will actually pull it out of position. And That's that, a lot of work to put that. That can be a disaster. So these are the ink balls? These are the ink balls, yeah. Pick up ink from the ink block there. Now, a sheet of paper then goes on here. Now I'm turning the frisket down. This is a, a light metal frame covered in paper. And this is basically a mask. Only the areas that want to print are going to touch the paper. Provide the pressure by pulling on this bar. We now have to move the press bed in again. So it's a double and, uh, printing process. It's a double printing process, and the reason for that is simply that with this simple screw mechanism, it's not possible to develop enough pressure to print a whole sheet in one go. And so there's our printed sheet. Look at that. So how many of these sheets would you expect to print in an hour? They should print 250 in an hour. But I can't really imagine that they ever managed that for a long <laughs> period. You could make it a little bit faster if you had a boy who was known as a printer's devil taking off the printed sheets, because that, that required no skill at all. Well, you've got an unskilled labourer here, and we've got a book <laughs> to print, so well. We'd better on. get on with the next sheet then. Yep. This new printing technology was developed by entrepreneurs, not the church. As the century progressed, they made more and more affordable books, which ordinary people might own. It was an invention that would change the world. Once the lye has removed all the grease from the laundry, it's time to wash it. You can find common washing places like this all over Britain for hundreds of years. Every community had to have somewhere to do their laundry. The key to Tudor laundry was brute force. It's hard work with this, but that's the point. That is what does the job for you. There's no chemicals involved. It is purely mechanical action. What you're doing is forcing molecules of water under tension through the fibres, and it just physically, mechanically dislodges the dirt. It's the bashing that does it. Once thoroughly wrung out, the laundry is laid on the grass to dry. The combination of water and sunlight produces a bleaching effect. So the monastery sheets 
are about six shades whiter than ours. The Abbott's book is nearly finished. It just needs binding. Apprentice bookbinder Eve Goodman is showing Tom the process. One of the things with printed books is you've got to be really, really careful to make sure you don't get the pages out of order. You look at the originals and there are quite a few where a page is upside down, where an apprentice <laughs> has not been quite paying attention. Once all the papers are folded, they are sliced in half. It should be one continuous movement. Okay. Bring the knife towards you. And fold it again to form sheets. Making sure that all the pages are the right way up. God, it's nice stiff paper, this. Oh, it's high quality, I tell you. At this date, the way bookbinding was working was you had a bookbinding oh. shop and people would come in with their pages, having had them printed and hand them over and say, I want you to bind those. This is the, the point at which industrious bookbinding is happening, where suddenly people can afford to go and buy their pages and take them to a bookbinder. I suppose the ability to mass produce books of this type means that when the Reformation occurred, Henry VIII was able to print the Bible in English and get it out there, making that sort of break from Rome so much easier, because obviously a lot of the Bibles were printed in Latin and you needed to have that separation. Exactly. A small press was used to hold the pages in place. While their spines were marked out and a series of slits cut. Right, this is the vital part. This is the part that holds all of the book together. This is sewing on the cord. So. A series of cords are lined up with the slits in the spine and the whole book is sewn together. So you are literally just stitching a book? Yeah, you're sewing it together. Have a look. It's actually it's very precise, isn't it? Yeah, it starts to feel like a book at this point. Doesn't yeah, it? a proper present. Next, the book needs to be cut to size. This is called a plough. You see there's a blade here. And you'll see, as soon as I've got through this lot, just how silky smooth the edge of the book is. If you run your finger down there, it squeaks. That's unbelievably smooth. That's amazing. The spine is rounded using a hammer. And you can see that there's, that there's a curve on it. There's a right. bit of a curve. And all books have got that. And it's all about making sure that the spine is as stable as possible. This also forms a ledge for the book's cover to sit on. So you can see the rounding over of the spine is so that you get this seamless yeah. curve. Originally covered in plain vellum, by 1500, luxury books had fine leather covers. And the craftsmanship required to make a book emphasizes really why they were such prestige gifts, doesn't it? And finally, the book is put in the press to set overnight. I think the abbot's going to be very proud to give that to his patron. Thank you for letting me observe. Oh, that's all right. Hey, Turkish. Hey, Georgie. Hey, Mildred. Back on the farm, the pigs are flourishing. Peter's tree hay is going down well. She absolutely loves it. I'm a convert to tree hay. It's fantastic. It's your food. Stop playing with your dinner. And with the crop finally dry, it's time to bring in the peas. Well, our pea scare has definitely worked. We still have a crop. I mean, I think there's a lot of peas on there. There's an awful lot of peas. Yeah. If we were trying to pick these by hand, we'd be here forever. <laughs> <laughs> the team are using scythes. First developed in Roman times, by the medieval era, they had spread throughout Europe. The smell's amazing, isn't it, Tom? It is. But it's turned out quite easy as well. It's loading the peas into our wagon. And these dried peas, we can thrash to get the peas out. But the stems, we can feed to our cows. <laughs> it 
You're making friends down there, Peter. Making friends. For the Tudor farmer, a good crop would have been a godsend. Feeding them and their animals, and even making a little cash if there was extra to sell. The crop will be beaten with sticks to release the peas, a process known as thrashing. Oh, isn't it fantastic hey. standing in a farm so completely full of one of our crops? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Look at that. There are hundreds of peas. Yeah, this is good. So I don't know if it's the weather or what, but this has been a really good crop. I think it's more down to our Tudor farming techniques, to be honest. <laughs> or maybe enough time spent on our knees in church. <laughs> the abbot's feast is just days away. But the elaborate food he will be serving was a far cry from the simple meals of ordinary monks. Benedictus Benedicat, per Jesum Christum Dominum Nostrum. Um. Every meal began with grace. Talking was forbidden, so instead, the monks communicated over the dinner table using sign language. Each monk had a daily allowance of two and a half pounds of bread and a gallon of ale, and two pounds of fish, a fundamental part of the monastic diet. But fish wasn't only important for the monks. The church decreed that for three days a week and on many holy days, lay people should not eat meat, only fish. Oh. While the general public had to make do with dried or salted fish, the monasteries had become expert fish farmers. They engineered elaborate systems of ponds to grow salmon, pike and carp, which will be served at the abbot's feast. Ruth has come to the monastic kitchen to prepare the food, starting with the carp. This would have been a luxury food. It's freshwater fish. And for most people, you know, that was in itself a sign of wealth and of privilege. Only those who had the rights to the fishing could take the fish. So freshwater fish carried a certain social cachet. You knew if you were served any of the freshwater fish that you were being given the produce of the owner of the land. Ruth stuffs the fish with anchovies, bread, herbs and spices a valuable commodity in Tudor England. The monks obviously tried to keep a really close eye on what they were using and spending in their kitchens, just the same way as they were keeping a close eye on the way their lands were being farmed. So monks were supervising chefs. Uh, they were in charge of the stores, of keeping count of food going in and food coming out. Ruth makes a cage to support the fish during the roasting. The church was instrumental in the advancement of fine dining. The frequent travels of the clergy meant new ideas and cooking methods spread throughout Europe. Ruth is trying out an elaborate pastry dish. I'm building a pastry castle. According to a menu from 1500, the Bishop of London served just such a thing at a dinner. It started with a moat of custard, and then within it was a great pastry castle. And in each of the turrets of the pastry castle, there'll be a different filling. And I rather thought, well, you know, if it's good enough for the Bishop of London, maybe it's good enough for our abbot. Peter has turned his attention to drinks for the feast. In the 1500s, wine was an expensive commodity. Here we go, pop that back on there. One way to make it last longer was to distill it into a spirit. Distiller Jack Green has made a still, the apparatus needed to produce brandy. So as I blow air into the coals here, they heat up, that heats the wine, but what happens yeah. then? 
We need to slowly bring it up yeah. until we come to the boiling point of the alcohol, which is lower than the boiling point of water. The alcohol evaporates, goes up into here, condenses on here, and run down this channel here, and then down the spout. Essentially, the, the alcohol evaporates at a lower temperature than the rest of the wine? Yes. Mm. Uh, little, last little sophistication is we put this wet blanket on it. Oh, like a little tea cosy, but yeah. the opposite. Yeah. So rather than keeping it hot... And that cools it down. Yes. Right. OK, so we're getting, we're getting a few drips coming out of here. Yes, the first alcohol that comes over is methanol. And methanol is the bad stuff. What happens if I drink that? Well, you'll probably go blind. Methanol has a lower boiling point than ethanol, so the first drops that come over are the methanol, and we discard those. When do you know that you've changed from methanol to ethanol? You just have to guess. Just have to guess. All right, OK. When the ethanol starts to come through, the spout is connected to a long tube which is cooled in a bucket of water. This will help the ethanol fully condense. We're getting some already. That's fantastic. No. So that, that is now the yeah. ethanol bit, coming through. A bit faster now. A bit faster. It's a very delicate business. Right. The reason it's called spirits is that uh, this is the body, and yeah. the spirit rises, and oh. this is the spirit. And that's why so you call the Holy it spirit. spirit sort of thing. Yeah. So carry on, carry so, on. So the, the, the vapour of alcohol is the spirit leaving the body of yes, wine. Yeah. By the way, I'm looking forward to trying it. Oh, yes, you'll be the first. I'll put my thumb over the spout and uh, it smells good. How does it taste? Just a little sip. Don't drink it all. That's really nice. Oh, good. That is really good. nice. Good, good. The food is prepared and the brandy distilled, but there's one more job to do before the feast. Peter and Tom have been called upon to serve at the banquet, and they need a lesson in Tudor etiquette. You have no idea what an honour this is, you know. This would have been gentlemen's sons who'd been carefully trained from childhood in how to be gracious, how to bow beautifully, how to serve at table with exactly the right etiquette. They'd have special carving lessons, I mean, so that they could do it precisely and cleanly and quickly. Uh, we've gone up in the world. <laughs> exactly, exactly. This okay. is your serving towel, right? You put the serving towel on for serving dinner. It's a, a symbol of what sort of role you play at dinner because he's going to have slightly different to you. So you get two towels because you're carving. Again, badge of office. I mean, the posher your servants were, the posher you were. Mm. And the better turned out your servants were, the more it reflected on you. What are your bows like? Come on, let me see your bows. Bowing or genuflecting? Yeah, it is more like a genuflect, yeah. You want to be doing the... the particularly when you're serving the food, you want to be able to come down with the trays held in front of you. Yeah, that's the sort of thing. You're doing that in two moves, I think. Go and have another go. I thought it was pretty good the first time, you see. On Try not stepping quite so far, just keep it really small and then that knee can come right into your heel. It's better. Look, you're going to go in there, you're going to be elegant, you're going to be lovely. We're going to do you proud. You are. Yeah. Go on. Go and be gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> it's the day of the abbot's feast and the monastery's most important patron will be dining. More than just an expression of hospitality, it was a vital chance to win favour and donations. As a sign of humility, following the example of Christ, a senior monk would wash the feet of the guests before dinner. Benedict Domini knows that hake to a donor, quae to a large tate summa sumptore, per Christum Dominum Nostrum. Amen. Amen. The seating plan was meticulous. Only the most distinguished guests would sit on the high table with the abbot. The further away you sat, the lower your social status. Each of the elaborate dishes, Ruth's pastry castle with a custard moat, 
sugar platters decorated with gold, and the carp, along with many other dishes, would be ceremonially presented to the abbot for approval before being served. Carving carp for the monastic table. It's not a case of filleting the fish. Instead, I'm running my knife around the outside of the fish, cutting off the fins and, and the tail and the head. And then the body, I'm going to cut it into equal sized portions, complete with bones. Because when it's served, it will still look like a fish, but each piece can be picked up and eaten as bite sized morsels. The drinks, served in cups, were kept on a board. The origin of the word cupboard. They would be offered to the top table, with the server waiting for the guest to finish before removing the cup. And Tom's prestigious gift is presented. As a token of our gratitude, I would like to present you with this book, A Life of St Edmund in English. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any scraps of food were put in an alms bowl to be given to the poor. The monasteries were so dominant in the provision of welfare that it was only after the dissolution that the government was forced to confront the issue. With the dining over, the guests were entertained into the night by musicians. Revelry was not uncommon even within the monastic walls. This has been a real insight into how those above us actually live. It's really different, isn't it? I mean, when you think, our dining seems quite formal. <laughs> we all put our best clobber on and we all sit there and behave ourselves, but this is a whole scale above. And also the sheer amount of food being consumed. It's yeah. crazy, isn't it? It is crazy. I mean, I know everything there gets eaten by somebody, but that initial mm. huge groaning board is quite a sight to see. I want to stress, I did not drop the custard castle. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought I was going to a couple of times. Despite how much wine you drank. <laughs> yeah, well. But this sort of event, it was what kept the monasteries funded. Yeah. Well, they're stuffed and so are their coffers. <laughs> Next time on Tudor Monastery Farm, it's harvest time. This has taken us four and a half hours. And look how much more there is. Produce a vital Tudor resource. Did you think of salt as a basic ingredient? Having to process it down just adds so much labor. <laughs> and enjoy some Tudor entertainment. I, I always knew that this scythe was meant for more than just harvesting peas. From here they shall not pass. <laughs> it's September, the beginning of autumn, and the days are getting shorter. The team are preparing for the end of their farming year and their time as Tudor farmers. Ruth, Peter and Tom need to make provisions for the winter. The pea crop has been collected and stored. Yeah, this is good. Flabbergasted with just how many peas we've got. Yeah. It's time to bring the animals back to the farm from their summer grazing. And the barley crop is now ready to be harvested. In the Tudor period, the harvest was the climax of the farming year. If the harvest failed, or the weather turned, it could lead to malnutrition and even famine. It's a lot of barley, isn't it? <laughs> it's a lot of work, but it looks amazing. Like, yeah. the colour is just incredible. As one of England's largest landowners, monasteries owned vast amounts of agricultural land. Most fields were open and not enclosed by hedges, unlike today. 
so tenant farmers would be given strips of land to cultivate within these large areas. So I suppose as much as this would be a huge open field, we would just have this strip here, wouldn't we? And also probably another strip over there and another strip over there, but everyone would be growing the same crop and all, be all hands to the pump. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's why school holidays take the form they do, isn't it? Because even students had to come out and do harvesting. Yeah. <laughs> we need bodies. The team are discovering just how backbreaking the harvest would have been for the Tudor farmer. I suppose how often we have to actually sharpen our tools. I mean, you think metal versus barley, it'd be an easy win, but it's not. Once it's cut, it needs to be bound into sheaves. Traditionally, it's the men who reap and the women who bind. So you run along behind the blokes, picking up all the loose stalks and then binding it into a sheaf. See, so much easier to control once it's bound like that. Every last grain from the harvest was precious. Even the smallest amounts would be gathered by those less well off, a practice known as gleaning. Well, for very poor people, it was a really important source of food. I mean, for anybody, that extra bit makes the difference, doesn't it? You know, if you think this is your year's crop, that little bit that's gleaned by the kids is the last week's food. Yeah. And you can get pretty hungry in that last week. But don't we know it? <laughs> <laughs> If it rained, then all the barley they had gathered would be ruined. To prevent this, the sheaves were stood upright on the ground, known as stooking, which allowed the grain to dry off. It is the most incredible amount of work. This tiny little piece that we've done of our strip, this has taken us four and a half hours to do. And look how much more there is waiting for us. As well as bringing in the crops, it was crucial in the autumn to prepare meat for the winter. The essential ingredient for doing this was salt. Ruth's learning the job of a waller, the women who were in charge of making salt. Salt was one of the most important commodities of the ancient world and also in the medieval. It was one of those things that you simply couldn't do without. It was necessary for survival, it was an important item of trade and a huge industry. However, it was one of the basic staples of life which you basically had to purchase for cash. It was part of the cash economy, unlike, say, carrots, which you could grow your own. In Tudor times, the majority of salt was imported from France or Spain but pockets of England were highly productive, especially areas in the north that had natural brine springs. The team have reconstructed the equipment used in this period. What I've got here are two different parts, a furnace and a pan. Now, the pan is made of lead, flat bottomed to evaporate off as much of the water to produce the salt. But that has sort of technical difficulties. Lead is a very soft metal. It means that under the weight of the water, there's a danger that it would collapse downwards. So that's what this frame over the top is for. It's actually for supporting the pan. The area set up for salt production were known as walling yards, hence the name waller for the women who work there. The pans were left boiling 24 hours a day. It takes some serious boiling to turn brine back into salt, but it is beginning to happen. The surface is crusting over. It's becoming so concentrated. Bucket after bucket after bucket of brine. Reduce, reduce, reduce. And there it is. Salt forming as a skin on the surface.
In autumn, the Tudor farmer would make provisions to ensure all their valuable animals would survive winter. We're coming up here because the weather's turned, it's got cold. We need to look after our flock, we need to protect our investment. And the best way to do that is to get them back to our, our homestead, to get them back to the farm. You can even sleep above your animals to get the heat coming up if you so need to. <laughs> You're not enjoying the, the cottage then? <laughs> the farm's said not good you, enough you, for you. We won't snuggle. <laughs> <laughs> the monastery's flocks could number thousands. Tenant farmers face the daunting task of herding their sheep from the fields back to their farms. So we've got sheep up there and sheep up there. Ideally, get them down the middle, work them down, yeah? Pincer movement? Pincer movement. <laughs> I'll see you in about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fall asleep <laughs> counting your sheep. The 1530s would see a turning point in sheep farming. At the end of the monastic era, the monastery's land was sold, so flocks were broken up and large common fields were enclosed. Yeah, on sheep. Yeah, them. This is good. They're going. It was the last time these huge flocks grazed together, changing farming enterprises and the landscape of Britain. Go on. It's going really well. This field is massive. It's, it's an open field. But the secret is not to go in there too hard and heavy. We're just slowly pushing them, tickling them here tweaking them there, and they're all bunching together in a mammoth flock. Good stuff, Tom. We don't even have a dog this time. I've got you, Peter. I've got you. The brine has been boiling for four hours. Enough water has evaporated for Ruth to attempt the next stage of the process, extracting the salt. The very best quality salt is this first scum, if it's clean. And there is one thing I could do to make sure that it really is clean. What I need to do is throw a load of proteins in and then those proteins will bind with any impurities that are there. The cheapest was ox blood, but I haven't got a huge supply of that. I'm going to try with some eggs. And just give them a good stir up. It's certainly gathering bits together in larger clumps. I mean, the sort of leaves and twigs it's not doing much to. But it does look like it's taking some of that funny colour out. Prices for salt varied depending on its purity and whiteness. There were different grades of salt, with the greyest and cheapest used for household cleaning and the whitest being reserved for salting cheese. That is looking much cleaner. Ruth is experimenting with forming salt in a traditional wicker cone. These would have been used for draining and transporting. It will be taken back to the farmhouse to be used for her winter preparations. Before the weather turns, the barley needs to be safely stored or the crop will be ruined. To ensure it is kept safe, the boys are using an age-old technique, picking gorse. So what we're going to do is actually make a layer of this gorse on the bottom of our barn. And these spikes will keep all the mice and the rats at bay, keep them out of it, but also raising the barley off the floor will just get some air underneath, keep it nice and dry, protect our investment, protect our crop. Although this is not a job I'm enjoying. <laughs> It seemed like it was going to be one of our easiest tasks, but uh, at the moment, bleeding now. <laughs> Prickling my ankles. I know, it's like taking an angry dog for a walk, isn't it? <laughs> mm. 
Autumn was the time for slaughtering animals, as it was harder to feed and look after them in the colder months. The tenant farmer would want to make their meat last for the months ahead. Ruth is trying a Tudor technique for preserving beef using the salt she's produced. You know, nowadays we cut up beasts according to certain joints we want to get out. But a Tudor butcher was looking for something rather different. He was looking to be able to fill his barrel with equal sized pieces of a portion for a man. Nobody really worried too much when they were butchering whether one person got mostly meat and another person got mostly fat, as long as you got your two pound weight. It's not exactly easy, though, butchering it up into beautiful pieces. Salting the meat for winter was usually the job of the Tudor housewife. I am really pleased with my salt cone, but I can tell you, it's a heck of a lot of work. After the salt has been crumbled, it is then rubbed onto every surface of the meat. And what I'm hoping to do by this process is to dehydrate the meat. I'm going to try and draw out all the juices within it because they are what allow infection in. Once the blood and other fluids have been drawn out of the beef, it is ready to be stored in brine, a mixture of water that has been boiled with salt and herbs. This will move the salt further into the tissues of the meat. There we go. Now, just need to leave it in the brine for three days for that brine to really penetrate. Once this has happened, the meat can be packed into a new barrel of dry salt for the final stage in preserving. During the winter, pieces of the meat would then be taken out and rinsed when required for cooking. So I'll jump over the piece you pass it over. Yep, let's get this gorse down. Oh, it's prickly, prickly stuff. If I pop it over there, and you can spread it with that. But I suppose not only have we brought our, our sheep and our cows in, we're also bringing in our harvest. And by doing so, we're leaving stubble fields. So we're taking away the home of the rats and the mice, and we're creating a food store for them. So they're all going to come here looking for food. So we need this gorse down here to protect it. Otherwise, we're in stuck. This barley would have been used throughout the year to make two of our staples, bread and ale, so it's very important. Well, one more load to get, and then we can have our feast. I'm looking forward to it. Let's crack on. Michaelmas, a feast day to St Michael, the protector of the Christian church. It marked the shortening of days and the end of the yearly farming cycle. Ruth is cooking goose, the traditional meat eaten at this time of year. I mean, nowadays, many people only ever eat goose if they eat it at all at Christmas. And that's a madness from a farming point of view. Utterly ridiculous. It's completely out of season. There are two points in the year when it makes sense to eat goose. One is towards the end of summer. At that moment, they are at their fattest and their juiciest. And it used to be called a green goose, a grass-fed goose. However, if you want to keep them through to Michaelmas, then there is one more source of free food to fatten up your goose. You set your geese free on your stubble lands and they pick about and any of dropped grains they feed on and fatten up a second time and that is a stubble goose just ready for Michaelmas.
the last of the barley is being brought in to be stored. It was customary, once the last field was reaped, for people to celebrate, marking joy and relief after the hard work that had gone into the farming year. The celebration took the form of Harvest Home and was steeped in rituals as communities across the kingdom thanked God for helping them with their harvest. It's, it's almost religious. It's like every single grain is precious. The amount of work and effort has gone into this. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Ronald Hutton has joined the team to help bring in the harvest. So this year, the fact that we've got such a good crop, I mean, this really is a moment for celebration. <laughs> Let's consider the alternative a moment. There was a disease in Tudor England called the bloody flux. In modern times, we thought it was some infection that had died out. Only with our relief work in Ethiopia and the Sudan, the late 20th century, did we realize that the bloody flux is the last stage of starvation. When your body is famished beyond a certain point, the wall of your intestine gives way in a massive hemorrhage that kills you off. Oh, and that's goodness. the alternative to getting in a good harvest, or even a harvest. That's pretty stark. With the dark prospect of famine avoided, the farmers would have been able to rejoice. Once the cart was filled with the last of the barley, the community would choose a harvest queen, a maiden from the local village who would be carried on top of the cart as it made its way back to the farm. Uh, what do you think? Uh, Mary? Uh, we think so? Uh, come on then, come on, come on, here she is! Here she is! Congratulations, Mary. That sounded pretty unanimous. You get the honour of a crown and ride in the cart. We're going to grace Lucky our you. last harvest. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, yes. one last little ordeal for you. Yes. There are generally games involved in bringing home triumphantly the last cart from the field. Games uh, usually guys versus gals, one which lasted for centuries after the Tudor era, was for the men, that's you I'm afraid, to try and get a small sheaf of cereal each into the barn. Now you see the ladies are lined up. <laughs> behind you, armed with water, who will try and empty the water over as you do so. <laughs> so this is speed and intelligence. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> you and your crazy ideas. This is history that does it to us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the messenger. And you're dry! <laughs> The rituals were followed by a great feast to reward the harvest workers for their toil. <laughs> Yay! Harvest over! It was a time of year which marked relief, expressed by giving thanks for farming success. Who's carving goose? It's Michaelmas, the feast of St Michael and all angels, which marks the real end of the agricultural year. That's why we're celebrating so hard. And the monastery has rewarded us for our labour by a customary extra gift of a goose, <laughs> which we roast for Michaelmas, to show that not only are we getting on well with each other, but we're getting on well with our landlord. But before we do anything, would you please speak the grace? Benedictus, Benedicat, Perjasum, Christum, Dominum, Nostrum. Amen. 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 Well, I have to say, this goosey is fair. Carve away. Well, Ronald, it is good to be alive. It certainly is right now. Remember, in 1500, we have winter ahead of us. Hyperthermia, 
darkness, and above all, boredom. We're going to have to while away those long nights with lots of stories. Well, as the beer is flowing, we'll have a few stories. <laughs> that is a wonderful, wonderful idea. Here's to you. With the harvest safely stored, the team have completed their farming obligations for the monastery. For the previous 800 years, monasteries had been at the forefront of farming, education and technology, as well as a hub for a range of craft and commercial activities. Monasteries wanted elaborate, beautiful buildings to display their devotion to God and skilled masons were in high demand. Peter has come to Gloucester Cathedral to meet with master mason Pascal Michalisson, who is restoring the stonework. What are you working on at the moment? A canopy. And is this, this for Gloucester Cathedral? Yeah. A canopy, that's the stone uh, which is covering a statue, the head of a statue. It always amazes me, cathedrals, they're, they're so beautiful and uh, so ornately carved. And uh, I suppose one of the few buildings that were built out of stone in, in the period. So, yeah, when we, we talk about stone architecture, we talk in medieval time, we talk almost exclusively about religious architecture. Yeah. That means the masons, uh, their uh, patron were the church. And very soon, most masons would be out of a job. Yeah, um, okay. after the dissolution of the monastery. Yeah. A mason would trace designs onto floors and use basic geometry and rules of proportion to create buildings that have lasted for centuries. What is extraordinary with medieval masons and Tudor masons is um, what they did with almost nothing and using very, very little tools and mostly they used their wit. Right. And that's the tool they built cathedral with, right. a pickaxe. And that's, uh, it. that's all they had. So could anyone become a mason? The modern equivalent to understand that spot on is you go to a football academy. Mm -hmm. Either you can kick the ball or you can't. Right. It's a ruthless but fair system of meritocracy. Yeah. It's at the end of the day, either you can have the skills of wielding the axe, or you can't. Well, I've kicked a few balls in my time, and they've never gone in the direction I want them to. But <laughs> hopefully, if I hit a few uh, blocks of stone, I can... Uh, yeah. yeah, but we, we can have a little demonstration. Building was usually done in the spring and summer months. The mason would work with stone that was fresh from the quarry and contained natural sap that made it soft and much easier to carve. The stone could be put in place and left to set in the winter. All right, that cut looks absolutely fantastic. Um, and you're doing that all by eye. Well, I, uh, I, I'm a trained mason, so it would be sad if uh, I couldn't <laughs> do it. <laughs> you make it look so easy. Have a go. OK. And this, this finger, this is basically for guidance, is it? This piece of stone will be placed in the cathedral when complete. You see, you've got to control the cutting angle, so you've got yeah, to go I in a bit. Straight away, it's coming yep. out like that, so I need to... So, uh, what, tilt the axe slightly up like that? Yep. Yeah, not bad. It's amazing the difference that the index finger makes. It, it does give you control. that control. A Tudor stonemason would traditionally serve a seven-year apprenticeship, a system which still operates today. And what is nice too is medieval masons didn't need to go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, all. Definitely it's not. Keep you fit. Well, based on that very, very little mm. bit of me yeah. chopping a bit of stone off, do you think I've got potential to be able to cook, kick a football in your, your stone mason we, academy? Yeah, I think we can put you on a three month trial. Right. <laughs> and we'll see. Hopefully, you won't regret that. <laughs> The 
The beautifully embellished monasteries were not just places of prayer. They were also places of refuge, and many monastic orders were involved in looking after the sick in the local community. Ruth has come to the monastic herb garden to pick plants that were believed to cure ailments common to the winter months. This is my last chance to harvest the medicinal herbs ready for the winter. And this is a job that you'll have found going on in pretty much every household all over Britain. You needed a stock of household medicine to keep you going. Medical knowledge in medieval times was quite limited, relying on herbs and folklore remedies. In about 1500, the Renaissance makes it to Britain. And what this really is, is a rediscovering of ancient Greek texts. It was changing the way people understood the plants around them. If you were to be an intellectual in 1500, one of the forefronts of research was in plants. The botany of this age was the science of the day. Monasteries were often large complexes of gardens, dormitories, and areas for prayer. All of these areas were rich in decoration. Great tiled floors were costly and were another craft that thrived thanks to the patronage of the church and monasteries. Peter has come to the abbey to meet with Karen Slade from the Company of Artisans, who will help him make tiles for a church. So how do you make one? Well, you have to start with some clay, then you can take a wire and you can cut it um, from a block. Wow. And you can then wedge that up and put that into a tile frame. So this is a frame that just helps you get everything the same size. The tiles would then be decorated. Um, so if you'd like to make a 1500s tile, this one is a pattern from Hales Abbey in Gloucester and was made in about, originally in about 30, 1536. So that's a, a fleur-de-lis, That's it? a fleur-de-lis, yes. And right. it, the three petals that you see here, they symbolise the Trinity. So you've got the Father, Son and Holy Ghost, a very popular symbol. I'm also right in thinking that Henry VII Yes, he did. This. Yes, yeah. he did. OK, so I just, what, line this up? Yes, that's it. Line it up nice and square. Line it up with the clay. That's it. And then you hit it with a hammer. Now, so am one, I hitting hard? You hit it relatively hard, in the middle first and then each corner. It, and then just if you hit it just about there, just level it up. That's it, brilliant. And just have a look and see how that's come out. Oh, there oh. we are, that's perfect. Certainly ready to use. The sunken areas on the pattern are filled in with another form of clay known as slip, which will then turn yellow once glazed and fired. And this is the only thing that they used to have to pay for. Right. So you can see how little I'm using compared with the red clay. The red clay was free, you could dig yeah. that up. But this white clay isn't found in very many places. So it's precious. And then that's it. And then that's it. So the next stage we need to do is to just have a go at scraping off the surface now that it's stiff. You're trying to get a clean edge in between the two colours. So if I just start with just this tiny piece at the top here, just so that you can begin to see that lovely clean edge. And how long does this take you? Oh, it takes ages. <coughs> it takes about, takes about 20 minutes um, per tile. I was going to say, the sort of process of making a tile did seem ridiculously fast and I knew there had to be a snag There somewhere. is a snag. This is the snag. So if you want to yeah. have a little go, if you want to take over, you just need to scrape it flat. One thing I never thought I'd be doing was shaving a tile. <laughs> <laughs> they will not know if the pattern has worked until it's been fired. I think that one's almost done, but that's All not right. going to make an entire floor, is it? So No, we have got a, we've on. got a few more. I know, you better get going, haven't you? <laughs> In Tudor England, the threat of fatal disease was ever-present, such as the sweating sickness and the bubonic plague. The average life expectancy was just 35 years. Herbs were used for treatments, and it was important to store them over the winter. Ruth's using the hyssop she picked to attempt a Tudor remedy. That's a load of honey. And I'm 
just bruising the first of many batches of hyssop. And I'm going to seethe the hyssop in the honey. Hyssop is one of those plants that was used really quite extensively in the period. It's not so much now. If you went to a modern herbalist, they wouldn't be all that impressed by using hyssop. But in 1500, it was considered to be an important medicinal plant. Medieval medicine was based on the theory of the four humours. It centred on the balance of four liquids in the body, blood, phlegm, black bile and yellow bile. Illnesses were believed to be caused by an imbalance of one of these humours, and medicines would aim to restore the balance. And every plant out there was assigned to one of the particular humours, to a lesser, a more or less degree. So hyssop, which is the one here, this is hot and dry. It's ideal for counteracting, for balancing diseases of phlegm. Anything where you have too much phlegm can be cured, according to this ancient Greek idea, by hyssop. A spoonful of hyssop mixture, mixed with hot water, was viewed as a useful remedy. The infirmary was a space within a monastery where the elderly and the infirm of the community could be cared for, whether they were there because simply of old age or, you know, whether it was a particular ailment. It was an area of the monastery that was heated, unlike the rest. Monks were allowed to not take part in all the offices of the day so that they wouldn't get too exhausted, and they also were allowed to bypass some of the dietary rules. There was a bed, there was warmth, there was food, but more importantly, in the eyes of the 15th and 16th century, there was spiritual care. Under the reign of Henry VIII, many of these monastic hospitals were closed. In their place came the civic and parish provisions, which laid the foundations for modern social welfare. Peter and Karen have come to the church at Hales Abbey to see their tiles put into place on the reconstructed floor. Oh, these, these look a lot smaller than when we were making them. Oh, yes, they do. They shrink quite a lot. You have to think about that when you're making a pattern. Um, oh, wonderful. Look at that. We're we'll bringing so, you more tiles. Um, it's looking pretty good, that. I mean, is it, are they fairly quick to lay? They're fairly quick to lay. Um, by using the lime screed to start with, that gives you a level base. Right. And then you're simply just buttering on the bedding material. So the tiles can be more or less flat anyway. Tiles could feature the crests of the benefactors paying for the floor, as funding works on religious buildings was viewed as a way of avoiding purgatory. Other designs had more religious overtones. So this is our tile. So that's it, after it's been scraped and then dried and then fired with a glaze on top. And the glaze has changed the colour um, from white, pure white, to uh, a yellow colour yeah, it's, when it's, they're fired. It's a so you're happy with beast. how it's come out, though? I think it's fantastic. Good. The distinctive yellow and red tiles were phased out from the 1540s, with the influx of tilers from the continent bringing new styles. All of a sudden, you've got wonderful Italian tilers um, and French tilers and people from Holland making Delftware, making blue and white. That, yeah. And as soon as people see blue and white tiles on the floor, um, they don't want brown and yellow anymore. Suddenly, their floors are in HD. <laughs> That's it. They, they, don't want, they don't want them anymore. The final process is to use a dry mortar mixture of lime and sand, brushed over the tiles into the cracks. Water is added to set the mixture and keep the tiles in place. At the point of dissolution, the large monastic houses were still spending money on embellishments such as these tiles or ornate stonework, when they really didn't see it coming. In 1500, the monasteries under Henry VII were thriving, even rivaling the power of the state. 
But when his ambitious son, Henry VIII, came to the throne, the new monarch came to resent the monastery's power, their wealth, and their control from Rome. The king also questioned the religious purpose of the monasteries. Influenced by ideas from Europe that monks no longer needed to pray on behalf of society, individuals should now pray directly to God to ensure their own salvation. In the 1520s, the wheels were put in motion for the king to break away from the Roman church and dissolve the monasteries. Professor James Clark, an expert in medieval history, has come to discuss the dissolution of the monasteries. I just find it utterly amazing that so enormous shift happened with remarkably little protest. It is remarkable. Uh, this is carried out in, in four years or so. They are, in fact, continuing to embellish their churches and the, the, the buildings of the convent at the very moment that the king's commissioners arrive. There's one uh, scene at one monastery where the king's commissioners are literally picking their way over the, the, the trenches that are being dug for the foundations of new walls and, and so on. What was the impact to the wider society? The institution that has really made and shaped many people's living and working environment is removed. Monasteries um, provided care for the sick through uh, hospital foundations, they uh, had school foundations, and these are closed at the dissolution. This is uncharted territory for many village and town communities across England. The team's time as tenant farmers of the monastery is coming to an end. The farmer's calendar was punctuated with religious festivals. Earlier in the year, the team set up a religious guild, a group that monitored its members' piety to ensure the salvation of their souls. Guilds often put on mystery plays, a tradition that was to be largely lost after the dissolution of the monasteries. A representative from the Guild would be in charge of organising the play and recruiting locals to act and help build the sets. The team are meeting with drama expert Dr Eleanor Lowe to find out what's involved. What do we mean by mystery play in the first place? Well, the word mystery links to the Latin word mysterium, which means a guild or a craft. So these plays were very much linked to the, the guilds who, who who, put on, who were responsible for each of these plays, and each of the guilds would be asked to put on their own section of the, of the story. So these, these mystery plays were a cycle of plays, several different plays, each of which told a sort of little snapshot moment from the Bible. They, they tell the story of the scriptures from the creation right through to the harrowing of hell. Mm. Yeah. So it's education and entertainment at the Absolutely, same time. all at the same time. Are we talking professional actors then, or people no. giving it a go? No, so these are amateurs as part of the guild, performing on the street in front of of their fellow townspeople um, <laughs> and trying to communicate a message. Ruth is in charge of making a popular Tudor drink for the audience at the play, using forgotten fruits from the countryside. Sugar was only known as a sort of rare spice in early Tudor England. So you couldn't possibly make jam or bottle fruit or any of those sorts of methods that later on in history people use for preserving fruit through the winter. No. In the 1490s, in 1500, fruit had to keep all by itself. So what you were looking for was varieties which would do exactly that. As fruit was expensive to preserve, any that could last for longer in the larder would be most welcome. The bullaces are ripe on the bullace tree. A really ancient fruit, one that sort of gets rather forgotten about these days. A little sort of type of plum, a little bit sour. But, I mean, you can eat them raw if you like sharp flavours. A little bullace being a, a, a more solid fleshed, less watery sort of a fruit, will keep for three or four weeks after it's been picked. As tastes changed and sweeter varieties of plums, such as damsons, became more popular, the bullace plum was largely forgotten. 
But what that means is it becomes something of an indicator species. If you're out in the countryside and you come across a great line of bullis trees, you're almost certainly at the site of ancient settlement. They're as much a part of our heritage as any church or other building. To impress the audience of the play, guilds would pull out all the stops to produce a memorable performance. Tom has come to see alchemist Jack Green to experiment with making Tudor pyrotechnics. Jack, it looks like yeah, we're about to start cooking here. We've got pestle and mortars, got ingredients, but this is actually what we're going to use to make Tudor fireworks. Fireworks, yes. Although they had been used in China since the 10th century, in England, it was not until the 13th century that a churchman called Roger Bacon first studied how to make fireworks. So, Jack, what's our first ingredient? Uh, charcoal is what we need. Ah. No great cost. Easily accessible. Yes. Yeah. This is basically the, the principle to grind all the ingredients down and yes. mix them, isn't it? Yes, and the finer you grind them, the more intimately mixed they are, the more powerful is the fire. Fireworks were produced by adding other minerals to the charcoal, like saltpetre. So what is saltpetre? Uh, well, it's a salt, and it's a salt that accumulates in manure heaps. It uh, helped ignition. There's also an element of risk, creating gunpowder. I imagine it's not something people wanted spread about, that knowledge. Um, the difference between a, a modern scientist, a modern chemist, and a medieval alchemist is that a modern chemist believes in publishing results. Alchemists had exactly the opposite attitude. All alchemists wrote in code. And uh, the, the fascination of alchemy is to work out what the symbols mean. The Tudor period was the first time these ratios of ingredients were studied, and gunpowder was made to be as explosive as possible. Jack and Tom are trying their own ratios. That Very good. That goes in there. This is for filling. Funnel. OK, and this and, goes uh, in the top. I do have a secret ingredient for this. We have here some gunpowder. <laughs> so we'll put a little of it in. And that so, goes down the bottom, does it? Yes. That will uh, make it uh, finish for the flourish, you see. Layers of the powders need to be built up to create different effects. Jack's experimental layer of gunpowder will, hopefully, make it go with a bang. And then a little more of this. We must be there by now, surely. I don't know, you're the boss. Well, you're the man with the eyes. Now we put the fuse in to start it off. That should be good. Mm. There we have it. So there we are. Good luck for the mystery play. Trust me, he's going to bring the house down. I hope not. <laughs> Ruth is experimenting with an ancient recipe to make an alcoholic refreshment for the audience to enjoy. It will be made from the freshly picked bullaces. people talk about monks and monasteries, the word mead comes up. Of course, the truth is that monks mostly drank beer, and they drank an awful lot of beer. But now and again, in party mode, there was a little bit of mead floating around. Your basic mead is just some honey and some water, and you allow it to ferment. But if you flavoured it with fruit, you called it melomel. That's what this is. So I'm just crushing up the fruit in order to release the juice. And then that just goes straight in our brewing vessel. And along with that, the honey. Now, the more honey I use, the stronger it'll be. In we go. And then the water. 
And that's it. You'll have noticed that I didn't wash the fruit first, and that's deliberate. I want the wild yeasts on the skin of the fruit to be in there, working, feeding on the sugars from the fruit and from the honey, quietly turning the water into alcohol. That's basically it. Ruth will leave it in the sun, allowing the fruit to ferment and hopefully create a tasty drink. It's the day of the mystery play. Yay! <laughs> For mankind shall dwell evermore in bliss that never fails within. Records give some details of how plays were put on, and the team have converted a farmyard cart into a stage from which these mobile plays would be performed across towns. So what's really interesting about these plays is that um, you know, they're very popular in the 14th, 15th century, and then by the time we get to the 1590s, they've really been censored out of fashion. And you know, that's partly to do with the dissolution of the monasteries, because of course they're you know, very much tied up with the Catholic Church calendar. Guilds chose a play that reflected their interests. Carpenters' guilds, as woodworkers, would naturally put on the crucifixion. And the team's Farmers' Guild has chosen a play centred on the salvation of souls by Jesus. The harrowing of hell. My brethren, I think our help is near, and soon shall cease our souls. Mystery plays were similar in style to modern pantomimes. Tom is playing Beelzebub, and the bad guy's arrival on stage is marked in the same way it is today, with a bang. Such uproar never was heard in hell. I am prince and principal. From here they shall not pass. <laughs> Records of the plays show accounts of pulley systems and elaborate sets being used. Peter is in charge backstage, using whatever he has to hand. They're there. They survived the dissolution itself. Then they just sort of peter pulled. out a bit afterwards. Yes, exactly. And then in the 16th century, we get the foundation of the permanent theatre structures um, and professional theatre companies. A curse! A fall! I sink into my pit! Jesus has saved the souls and banished the devil. Lightning down. Lightning off. And a cloud of peace and love. Here we go. Praise his glory! Yay! Yay! Well done, guys. Well done. Sorry, Peter. Awesome. That's brilliant. Well done. Go take the praise. The festivities will carry on for many hours, and Ruth's Melamel has turned out to be a hit with the audience. In 1534, Henry VIII made himself supreme head of the church, breaking away from Rome. It marked the beginning of the end for the monasteries. It would be the last time that religion and farming were so entwined. Over the course of the next four years, monasteries were pulled down their valuable land and materials stripped and sold off. The great structures that had dominated the landscape for centuries were left as empty shells. They're really melancholy places, these, aren't they? We are standing in a monastic graveyard. We are standing in the end of an era that was just so total. 
It's important to remember it's not just the loss of these buildings, it's the social services that are lost by the monasteries closing down, the education, the caring for the old and the sick, the employment, and it takes near enough a generation to replace this. But also, I suppose, monasteries are a victim of their own success. They are these institutions of wealth and power, of craft and industry, of raw materials. And Henry VIII looks at them and says, I want that, yeah, I want that. I want that. It is a lost age, you know, a lost past. And you think what a huge turning point it was in our history. It's the last day on the farm. The boys have come to say goodbye to their faithful oxen, Gwyn and Graceful, and give them their winter feed. These girls have worked so well for us. Yeah, haven't they? We have been a team, guys. You have been our farm. Done our ploughing, you've done our harrowing, you've moved <laughs> carts of wool, you've kept us in check, haven't you? Well, they really have been Harrow steady the performers, haven't they? Yeah. That's the thing. Well, someone had to be. <laughs> yeah, indeed. They picked oh. up the slack where we've let it go. <laughs> yes, you'll get some food in a second. Gonna miss you guys. Without them, we couldn't have got half the stuff done. And we built up a working relationship and... It's a real insight at just how reliant a Tudor farmer would have been on their livestock. Without these guys, you don't have a farm. Without a farm, you don't have a livelihood. Well, it's been emotional. Best of luck, girls. In 1500, the monasteries had been at the peak of their power and influence. They were one of the largest landowners in England. Controlling mines, waterways, and farms. And holding a virtual monopoly over the wool trade. I thought they were supposed to be white sheep, these ones. <laughs> <laughs> they were the dominant spiritual and cultural focus in Tudor society. The dissolution transferred the power of the monasteries, along with their land and wealth, to the crown. Some aspects of monastic authority would be taken over by the state and private enterprise, Others would simply disappear. And the farming landscape of Britain was changed forever. Here Bosra vestibus in stola sua formosus. Amen. It's been amazing working on a Tudor monastery farm. I mean, turning up. It was just hustle, bustle, the marketplace. Everything was going on. It was just idyllic. Everything's been fun, but it's definitely been hard work. You know, the weight's dropped off a little bit. You know, a few aches and pains, bruises, sores, but it's been fantastic. I wouldn't change anything. this year almost a sort of nostalgia that we were living a life that was about to slip away. This is a, such a pivotal moment. It's like the deep breath that Britain takes, ready before it suddenly launches into new way of living. <laughs>